You know it's this. Take a perk and talk it and see. Money swallowing like six. Did it perfect to the kid. Got a million on my head. I'm nothing better. Put on a robe. I just win. I don't want to get a million dollars. The devil is in that shit with a gun. Hello and welcome back, fellow anime lovers, to Manga Muse. I am delighted to have you join us once again in the world of fanfiction and fantasy. This is the fifth part of What If Deku Enters Gravity Falls. Special note, this fanfic is written in a masterpiece of JK Awesome on fanfiction.net. Do check and support the author too. Now smash the like, share and subscribe button for more. Also press the bell icon so that you never miss such great parts. Thanks for the introduction. Now let's dive into the world. The camera is turned on to show Izuku, who is standing on the beach of Gravity Falls during a foggy night. Izuku, welcome back to A Hero's Guide to Gravity Falls number 3, where we film some of our adventures in this town. Just in case some future hero ends up here and wants to understand more of the nature of this place. Today, our subject is this tooth. The camera turns to show a massive tooth, with Mina standing next to it. Mina, I'm here for scale. The camera shifts again, showing Izuku once more, now standing in front of the tooth. Mina and Achako are with him. Izuku, it's strangely human, but it's gigantic. The author of the journals describes giants, or at least, one giant, in his notes. So could this be a giant's tooth? Or perhaps a large lake monster? There's only one way to know for sure. Ochako, it definitely seems to have come from the lake, so we'll be taking the boat out to explore. Shadow off screen, and I'm gonna hold the camera the whole time. Achako, yup. Izuku, first, we asked the local ranger for some information about it. The scene changes to show Magakit's son, the local ranger, arranging some fishing poles. Ranger, tooth? No, don't know nothing about a tooth. Mina, we were thinking of paddling out on the lake tonight to figure out where it came from. Ranger, bit of advice, kids, you see bubbles on that lake, run. Izuku, what? Why? Ranger, enough questions. The ranger blocks the camera with his hand. Ranger, get that camera out of here. The scene switches back to the kids, who bring out their flashlights and board a small wooden boat. Mina, what are we supposed to be looking for? Shouto, bubbles in the water, right? The camera pans around, eventually pausing and zooming in on some bubbles popping up next to a small island. Shouto, found some. Izuku, by the island. Maybe some sort of creature who lives there. What was that? The camera shakes and fuzzes out for a moment before everything starts to shake. Izuku, what's happening? Ochako, doesn't matter. Row, row, row. The camera is set down so that Izuku and Shouto's spooked faces are in view, as well as the island, which shakes more and more before rising out of the water, revealing a terrifying face with glowing eyes and massive teeth just below the surface. The island floats over to them, revealing skeletons on the underside. Island, incomprehensible sounds. Shouto, it's getting closer. Izuku, keep rowing. The camera short circuits. The next scene is on the beach. Izuku, I don't know there it is. Izuku picks up the camera, showing a destroyed boat crushed under a massive tooth. Izuku, after it attacked us, it sank back into the water and lost another of its teeth trying to eat our boat. Mina never going back in that lake ever again. Izuku, but the important thing is, we survived, barely. Mina, never. The camera stops playing. Izuku, welcome back to A Hero's Guide to Gravity Falls number 21. Today, our subject is this man right here. Izuku steps aside, and the camera focuses on a man who seems completely normal, reading a newspaper. Izuku, seems completely normal, right? But here's the thing everyone has only ever seen one side of him, his left side. At first, this seemed impossible, because the people on the other side of him must be seeing his right side. But then we tried to film him from different angles, and this happened. The camera switches to show the man once again, walking backwards so no one sees his other side. Ochako, he's all left here. The camera switches again, showing the same scene from the other side, and yet, the exact same motion is playing out. Only in reverse the man is walking normally, only his left side showing. Mina, this is just strange. The camera goes back to Izuku. Izuku, so, what is the mystery behind this guy, and why can no one see his right side? Our current theory is that he warps space slightly around him, 
but how does it work? Why does he feel the need to hit his other side? Today we're going to find out. You ready? Shouto from behind the camera, I guess. The scene changes to Izuku standing in front of a nondescript building. He and Shouto enter to reveal that it's a bowling alley. Regular? Man, I'm sorry, cameras aren't allowed in here. Izuku, don't worry, it's not on. Shouto, I'm just holding it for him while he pays. Izuku, could you get me size 7 shoes and a bowling ball? Regular man, I don't see why not. The man grabs Izuku's shoes for him and goes to get a bowling ball. While he's bending down, Izuku turns him around to reveal a completely open other side, with tiny green blobs working all the different mechanisms to keep the robot man functioning. Green blob 1, we're blown, shut it down. All the blobs start eating glowing cubes and disappearing. Green blob 2, I can't, I have a family. Green blob 1, you signed the contract. All the blobs eat their cubes and vanish, leaving the one-sided machine to deconstruct and blow up, setting the sprinklers off. The scene shifts to Izuku and Shouto heading out of the building, looking horrified. Izuku? Um, that concludes guide number 82. Um, I think I'm going to burn this tape. Welcome everyone, to the official grand reopening of the Mystery Shack. Stan spread his arms out wide as everyone cheered. After the defeat of that skunk little Gideon, the crowd booed at the name. No, please, boo harder. The attendees were happy to comply. And of course, a round of applause for my employees, who also deserve some of the glory for our victory. Izuku grinned awkwardly at the cheers that went around. It was still so strange to get used to being praised like this, especially in a town such as Gravity Falls. Toby waddled up. Smile for the camera, everyone. Your camera's a cinder block, Toby, Stan said flatly. Toby pouted. I just wanted to be a part of something. The reporter, Sandra, nudged him aside. Smile for a real camera, everyone. They all grinned and posed as the crowd cheered. Ochako reached behind the makeshift stage and pulled out a poster. Don't forget about the after party at 8, everyone. It's going to be the party of the year, and you don't want to miss it. Lights, cameras, karaoke, everything you could ask for. Wendy sounded a foghorn. Buy a ticket, people. We all know you've got nothing else going on in your lives. Come on, pizza guy, don't lame out on me. The eager townsfolk followed her away, and the rest of them took in the moment of calm. Things are finally going our way, huh? Stan commented. The town loves us, the shack is safe. I finally got that Gideon smell out of the carpet nice to have things working well for once. It's a good change. Mina leaned up against the counter. Content. Agreed. Since things are going our way and all, Izuku hedged. Mind if I have the journal back? Stan shrugged easily. Sure, no problem. Already wrote down the good attraction ideas. He leaned under the counter and pulled out the journal, handing it to Izuku. Here you go, kid. Gratefully, Izuku took the journal back, a bit surprised at how easy that was. Just don't go messing with that thing when you're supposed to be working, all right? Of course. There would be plenty of other times he could go through the journal in his free time, after all. All right, I hereby call this mystery crew meeting into order, Achako announced cheerfully, as they all gathered in their attic bedroom. With all the money he was getting from the reopening, Stan had finally gotten two more beds, and so Izuku and Shadow had just finished setting their sheets up both immensely relieved not to be sleeping on the floor anymore. Are we really still calling ourselves that? Shouto wondered. Yup, no taking it back now. Anyways, Izuku and I have been working on a little something. She grinned and revealed their own little conspiracy board, labeled Gravity Falls Mysteries. Tada! Now, I know we decided to put searching for a way home on hold, but that doesn't mean we can't try and look into who the author of the journals is. Clearly the guy knew something about dimensional travel. If we can find him, we'll be on the right track. Okay, but how? Mina wondered. Everything we've tried so far has been a dead end. All of them studiously ignored the smashed laptop in the corner of the room. Have you found anything else like the bunker in the journal, Izuku? Not yet, the green-haired boy admitted. I was actually thinking of asking Stan for journal too, since I'm pretty sure Stan took that one as well. Maybe there's something in their Gideon mist, or just ignored. Have we looked over the idea that Stan might be the author yet? Shadow wondered. 
I can't be the only one who hasn't forgotten how he first acted when learning we were from another world, or the look on his face when he realized just what journal Izuku had. I've seen Stan's handwriting though, and it doesn't fit with the author's, Mina argued. Izuku tapped the journal thoughtfully. He could have purposefully changed his handwriting, but that seems a bit extreme. Then again, this author is pretty paranoid. I honestly don't think it's Stan, though. He flipped through the pages. Considering how terrified this guy is of Cypher, if Stan were him, he would have been more aware when Cypher was invading his mind. That's a good point, Shouto sighed. Hey, it was a good theory, Mina encouraged. A bit unrelated, but what about Bill's words on how everything we love will change, Izuku offered. What do you think he meant? Ochako frowned. Hasn't everything we love already changed? I mean, we're in another world, in an attic, solving supernatural mysteries. I don't know about you guys, but that's not how I expected to spend the last month and a half or so, I think. They all pondered on this for a moment. We've really been here a while, haven't we? Mina said quietly. And we haven't heard anything from home. Not even a message. Hey, interdimensional travel is probably pretty hard, right? Izuku offered, smiling and pushing down his own unease and growing fears. I bet they're working as hard as they can on getting us back. This is Yue we're talking about. If anyone could figure it out, it's them. Right? Yeah, they'd do whatever it takes to get their students back. What went unspoken was the traitorous thought that if Yue couldn't get them home, they might truly be stuck. A minute passed, and Shouto stiffened. Do you hear that? Hmm. Ochako peered out the window, and startled at the sight of the black car pulling up to the shack. Well, that's new. Stan was pacing nervously near the door, and shot them all a panicked look as they exited the stairs. You kids, go back up, especially Mina. These are government goonies, clear as day. The doorbell rang, and Stan balked, making a shooing motion. Up, now. Shouto exchanged a startled glance with Mina, before the four of them headed further up the stairs, pressing against the walls to listen in. Welcome to the mystery shack, gentlemen, Stan said. What can I get for you today? Snow globes? Keychains? Rare photos of us presidents? I'm Agent Powers, and this is Agent Trigger, came the unimpressed response. We're here to investigate reports of mysterious activity in this town. Mysterious activity? Well then you've come to the right place. I've got lots of mysterious attractions to show you. It's why people come all this way if you'd like to pay the entrance fee. Not these sham exhibits, genuine mysterious activity, Powers interrupted. I don't suppose you could show us any of that? What, like actual magic or something, Stan scoffed. Are you guys really the government? Am I being conned here? All right, who set you up to this? Was it that old hag with the world's largest yarn ball? She's always nasty when it comes to taking down her competition in tourist traps. I can assure you, we're the real deal. Powers insisted. Now, if you'll excuse us, we'd like to conduct our investigation. With what arrest warrant? Stan snapped back. This is ridiculous. I don't have to stand for this. If you're here for the tour, you can take the tour. If not, get out of my shop. And take these complimentary Mystery Shack stickers with you, Suze piped up, presumably giving the agents the stickers. There was a moment of silence before, all right then, we have other spots to investigate. We'll be on our way. Footsteps headed towards the door, which then slammed shut. The four of them exchanged glances. So, Shouto finally said, Time to update the conspiracy board. Time to update the conspiracy board, Ochako agreed. Come on, let's go do that. They headed back upstairs. Izuku got out a small piece of paper and a pen. Okay, government agents power and triggers, investigating paranormal activity in Gravity Falls. This means that the government is definitely aware of the supernatural in this world. Or at least, the U.S. government is. And they suspect Stan, Mina added. Is there a history there? They said they have other spots to investigate, Shouto pointed out. Maybe this place is on their radar simply because it's called the Mystery Shack. Ochako looked thoughtful. Do you think they're here now because of what happened with the Gideon bot? I mean, a giant robot with some sort of magic at least in the amulet cancelling department. Showing up out of nowhere and then exploding might be a pretty big deal. That's a good point, Izuku agreed, writing it down. 
Whatever the case, we need to keep a lower profile while they're around. Who knows what they'd do if they found out where we're from. They all looked towards Mina, who shrugged. Everyone around town knows me by now, maybe I could just say that I'm a cosplayer. The townsfolk would buy it, but who knows if the agents would. We don't know how weird the rest of this world is, might just be Gravity Falls that's strange. Dealing with people who can think normally is going to take some getting used to. Ochako groaned, leaning back. There's gotta be ways we can distract them, so they stay away from the shack. We're kind of local media darlings right now, maybe we could have some rumors put in the paper, send them on a wild goose chase. Shouto nodded along. That could work. We should go through the gossiper, since they're smart, they're probably going to be looking through the less reputable sources for info on the paranormal. That would mean dealing with Toby again though. Mina slumped into her pillow. I don't want to deal with Toby again. She lifted her head up sideways. Izuku, any ideas? Maybe, Izuku admitted, looking lost in thought. I don't know, it just occurred to me, but we're hiding from the government and living with a known criminal. That's so, we're planning on misleading law enforcement and we're training to be heroes. Shouto winced, noting the uncomfortable looks on the girls' faces as the implications of what Izuku was saying started to sink in. Not everyone is good just because they work with the law, he finally responded. Not all pro heroes are good, even. The world isn't black and white like that. Right, I know. Izuku still looked troubled. It's just weird to think about. Seeing as Izuku was chosen to be a hero by All Might himself, Shouto could believe it really was weird for him. He kind of wished he could have that same idealism. He just couldn't see the world like that. His own idealism when it came to heroes had been burned out of him years ago. Mina wasn't surprised when Grenda and Candy showed up to the party. In fact, it was great to reunite with them. It's been a little while since the puppet show, Candy noted. Good to see you guys again. Is Shouto still being a grump? Granada wondered. They all winced at the reminder of the puppet show. Not as much as I was, Shouto finally said, and at this point, they knew each other well enough that Mina could see he was trying not to let his real emotions show. Good. And Grenda pulled him into a one-armed hug, nearly squeezing the air out of him. Then we're all going to have a lot of fun partying hard tonight. Fantastic, Shouto's muffled voice replied. It also wasn't a surprise to see Wendy's friends show up all giving their co-worker high fives. You seriously took down Gideon and became a star without us? Nate pouted. Wendy laughed. I've seen tons of weird shit working here. It's been awesome. She turned and gave the four of them a cheerful wink before heading off with her pals. Some of the other people, like Tyler, Lazy Susan, Manly Dan, and other shop regulars, were expected as well and all showed up pretty fast. What Mina hadn't expected was that, after only 30 minutes had passed, pretty much the entire town was there to celebrate. Ochako leaned up against one of the punch counters next to her. McGucket, that kid who got eaten by the Summerween trickster, the crazy lifeguard, it's like everyone we've met is here. I know, right? Who'd have thought we were so popular? A small cough made her turn her head, and her smile became a bit more stiff. Even you two are here, hello, officers. Blubs and Durlin stared back at her. We got complaints about the loudest party in town, Durlin said. Blubs leaned closer. Three words. We. Want. In. Mina grinned and gave them both a party horn. Welcome in, boys. Ochako laughed as they walked past, blowing their horns. I guess their incompetence is a good thing this one time. And they're pretty sweet together, so we can let it slide for now. Up by the stage, Suze finished setting up the karaoke machine to the cheers of the partygoers. Wanna sing terribly together? You bet I do. Suddenly, the crowd got a lot quieter, everyone looking towards one of the entrances. The two girls looked in that direction and spotted a familiar black car. Shit, Achako said shortly, summing up both their thoughts. The two agents made their way through the crowd and towards them as Shouto and Izuku slipped in right next to them. So, you're the kids that were on the news, the man with Agent Power's voice said. If you don't mind, we'd like to ask you a couple of questions. His eyes landed on Mina, who shifted under his gaze, especially you. After a terror-filled second of silence, Mina found her voice. 
What, do you like my cosplay? That's really nice of you. I worked hard on it, you know? Powers and Trigger both blinked and stepped back in surprise. Feeling a little emboldened, Mina continued. I mean, I don't know why some weird people in suits would want to talk about my cosplay with me, but I guess you should never judge a book by its cover. Are you guys looking for tips? Powers huffed and straightened up, recovering. No, and I doubt that's a cosplay. And he reached out to grab one of Mina's horns. Quick as a whip, Shouto grabbed his arm, shooting the agent a death glare. Don't touch her, you self-righteous pricks. You've crossed way over the line, and I have half a mind to kick you out of this party by force. I'll help, Achako said coolly, rolling up her sleeves. What the hell is wrong with you? You can't invade people's personal space like that. We'll find someone to escort you two out, Izuku said, the only one of them who kept up any pretense of politeness. I can do that. They all turned to see Wendy approaching, glaring at the men. Seriously, it's time for you two to leave. Yeah, leave those kids alone, someone called out from the crowd. They helped save the town. Yeah, get lost. We don't want you here. Mina bit her lip to stop herself from smiling as she looked out on a sea of defensive faces. Powers and triggers seemed to realize that they were the targets of what easily could become an angry mob, pulled back. I see. We'll leave, then. Powers gave the four of them a scathing glance. For now, but if nothing else, take this to heart. Don't trust Stan Pines. We will be back for him. And with that, Trigger adjusted his suit, and the two were off. Mina watched them go, then turned back to the crowd, finally smiling. All right, everyone, who wants to see some awesome dance moves? I've been waiting to show off my skills. The crowd went wild, and she couldn't help but laugh, before looking back to her friends, warmth building behind her eyes. Thanks, guys. Of course, Izuku insisted. That's what friends do. We're here for you, Mina, Achako promised. Just like you are for us. Shouto gave her a smile, and Mina's heart felt more than full. All right, karaoke time. I'm gonna show off my amazing talent of dancing and singing at the same time, and I want you all up there with me. You can dance, Achako's eyes practically sparkled. This I've got to see. I can't sing, Shouto protested, as the other three dragged him along. Ochako patted his arm. Neither can I, she assured him cheerfully. We'll be failures together. The rest of the night passed in a similar manner, happy, yet mundane. Sometimes magic just wasn't needed for a good time. You ever see something that really makes you want to punch a person's face in? Ochako wondered aloud, as she looked over the day's newspaper. Plenty of times, Shouto agreed. What happened now? Pacifica. She moved the paper so he could see the headline, Pacifica Northwest declares V-Next the new hot trend of the summer. How can V-Next even be a trend? They're just a normal clothing item. Shouto shrugged. Ask Mina. She's the only one with any fashion sense out of the four of us. Fair point. Achako could make colors look nice sometimes but they all knew Mina was the only one with any claim to actual fashion expertise. But seriously, just looking at Pacifica's snobby face in the news is pissing me off. You've just gotta try and ignore people like her, Mina said, as she and Izuku entered the room. Papers or not, it's not like her opinions actually matter. She's just some rich chick who thinks she's special because she has money. Exactly. And that irritates me, Achako sighed. But you're right, best to ignore her, even if it sucks. She summoned the remote to her and turned on the TV as Stan walked by, a pan in his mitten-covered hands. Who wants Stan cakes, he asked aloud. They're like pancakes, but they probably have some of my hair in them. Pass, everyone said in unison. I'll take them, Mr. Pines, Sue's voice called out from the other room. Stan frowned. Sure, but what are you even doing in my house this early in the morning? and on a Saturday. Isn't he always here though? Honestly, if Ochako hadn't stayed at Sue's place for a bit, she'd probably suspect he actually lived at the shack with them, considering how often he was around. Stan considered this and shrugged. Fair point. Looking for a distraction from your horrible life? The TV asked. Victory, honor, destiny, mutton. These old-timey sounding words are alive and well at the Gravity Falls Royal Discount Putt Hut. No mutton available at the snack shop. You know, Izuku mused, 
Life might not be horrible, but I think mini golf sounds like it could be a lot of fun. Even Stan seemed interested. Might be a nice waste of a Saturday. And old timey, Mina agreed, pumping a fist in the air. Victory. Honor, Izuku cheered. Destiny, Shouto said, at a much calmer volume. Ochako couldn't help but laugh. Mutton. The cheer was infectious enough that Suze and even Stan got in on the action, chanting, Victory, Honor, Destiny, Mutton, as they headed towards the car, ready for a fun game of mini-golf. And the pig bear can look after the house, Suze said, closing the door behind them, and leaving Waddles to his relaxing position in front of the television. The putt hut itself was surprisingly large and well put together, with all 18 holes having their own unique style, from a pirate ship, to a windmill, to the Eiffel Tower. Many of them looked genuinely difficult. When was the last time any of you played mini-golf, Izuku wondered, as they each got their own clubs. I don't think I've played in at least a couple years. Last year for me, I think, Ochako said, after a moment of thought. Someone from middle school had a birthday party at one. I've played a lot of mini-golf with my parents, Mina told the others brightly. It's cheap and fun, and I'm actually pretty good at it. Shadow shrugged. I've never played. This'll be a new experience for me. Well then, we'll make sure it's a fun one, Izuku assured him, stepping up to the first hole. He measured the distance for a moment before hitting the ball. It rolled up the course, rounding towards the hole and going slightly wide. Ah well, at least it's close. You did great, Mine assured him, as he moved back, letting her take his place on the course. All right, let's see here. Carefully, she lined up her shot, before hitting the ball with practiced confidence. It practically glided through the course, all the way to the end, where it easily sunk into the hole. Looks like I've still got it. You're really good at this, Ajako cheered. Mina beamed. It's just a lot of practice, that's all. Nonetheless, her victory streak continued throughout the rest of the holes, either getting hole-in-ones or landing the ball right next to the hole. As they went forward, other visitors at the park seemed to take notice, until the 18th hole, where they'd gathered a bit of a crowd for Mina's final putt. She took a deep breath, before relaxing and hitting the ball. It slid past the windmill obstacle, into the mill itself. There was a bunch of clanking, and then the ball came out the other end and right next to the hole, rolling around it without dropping inside. The crowd groaned and all walked away. Mina let out an exaggerated huff. Fairweather fans. Anyways, hole in two isn't bad at all. Things random anyways, Stan agreed. It's not that big of a deal. And you're still probably the best mini-golfer here, Izuku encouraged, looking at his own mini-golf score and wincing. Just as he said that, another ball rolled out of the windmill and right into the hole. Izuku looked up to see Pacifica and her parents standing there smugly, the rich girl herself wearing a purple polo shirt that matched her club. Oh, would you look at that, she cooed. I didn't know it was Hobo's golf-free day. How adorable. And if it isn't the Pines family, fat, old, weird, lame, creepy, and angry. Oh, that bitch, Ochako hissed. Stan seemed to share the same sentiment. Suze, would it be wrong to punch a teenager? Izuku spun around to face him. Yes, it would. Shouto had narrowed his eyes at the creepy bit, but kept his cool. That's rich, coming from a family of frauds? How is learning your ancestor was the village idiot working out for you? Rich is actually the perfect way to describe it, Pacifica replied cheerfully. See, we've got this amazing thing called money, and it makes all of those bad things go away. Not that you'd understand, of course. Shouto twitched. Sure, but money can't buy you skill, Mina said. You've dressed all fancy, but that doesn't mean you're actually good at the sport. Well, it's a good thing I've got a trainer then. The Olympics had mini golf once, did you know? And Sergei took gold in it. She shrugged. So if you don't mind moving out of the way of the professionals. She walked over to the bonus hole which featured a mini-volcano, before hitting her ball. It went straight in, causing the volcano to erupt. Enjoy second place. Give her a hand, folks. The surrounding people clapped sadly, and Mina looked quite a bit more upset. Oh yeah, that bonus hole was easy, compared to literally every other hole. Which, by the way, I didn't see you do. You talk big for someone who acts like a one-dimensional mean girl stereotype. 
Underneath that, I don't think there's anything special about you. Pacifica froze in place, then turned around slowly, fury etched on her face. You know what? Fine, let's do this. We'll have a rematch. See who's the better mini-golfer. Mina refused to back down. Not much of a rematch if you never competed in the first place, but fine. Let's do it. Hear ye, hear ye. The oddly dressed man in the golf cart screeched, driving slowly over. The park is now closed, due to weather. The king of mini-golf has spoken, he tried to back up. But the janky golf cart just crashed into a pole. This isn't over, Pacifica hissed, even as the onlookers walked away, disappointed. You, me, midnight, we'll settle this then. Mina smiled in her face. Of course, I'll be there. You sure you guys want to do this? Izuku asked, as the six of them shared some chips and dip at one of Gravity Falls diners, while the rain poured down outside. We'll be fine, Ochako assured him. Mina and I can handle ourselves. It'll be fun, like a girl's night, where we take that rich prick down a notch. Really, it's for the best, Mina agreed, sipping her drink. I don't think anyone's told that girl no in her entire life. Someone's gotta do it. Mina had never liked bullies, after all. And while she could let whatever Pacifica said to her roll off her back, the other girl insulting her friends and the guy who had taken them in was the final straw. Weather should be all cleared up before midnight anyways. Maybe I can get some practice in before then. Stan munched on his taco thoughtfully. Going to the golf course after dark, huh? I don't know, we'd have to break in and just kidding, let's break in. Izuku kept watch with Sue's night vision goggles while Stan loosened one of the wooden fence posts, opening it so that the two girls could fit inside. Thanks Stan, Ochako whispered, as she ducked into the park. Yeah yeah, hey, Mina, got something for you. Mina paused, halfway through the fence, to look at him. Stan pulled out one of the sticker books from the shack and stuck one to her shirt a circle with a golden trophy saying, you da best. He gave her a thumbs up. Knock her dead, kid. Nina couldn't help but smile. Thanks, Stan. Then she followed Ochako inside, grabbed some balls and a club, and got to practicing. Most of the holes, she easily cleared, again and again, until she was getting hole in ones most of the time. But when it came to the 18th hole, I don't get it, Ochako admitted, as yet another ball rolled right past the hole joining the multitude of other failed attempts. What's wrong with this hole? We know there can be a hole in one from earlier, so why is it so impossible? As she said this, the windmill groaned ominously, something clattering around inside it. The two girls exchanged looks. An animal got inside of it, maybe? Mina suggested. One way to find out. The two lifted their golf clubs up, just in case, and slowly opened up the obstacle. Inside, wasn't an animal. Instead, what seemed to be a little village right out of a European picture book was cheerfully lit up. Tiny people with heads made of golf balls, dressed in what Mina assumed was traditional European clothing, happily rolled balls around and acted out the lives of tiny villagers. Mina and Ochako gasped. The little golf people noticed them and gasped. The golf people started screaming, and Mina and Ochako instinctively started screaming as well. There was a moment of silence, where they all just stared at each other. Then a little figure with a blue golf ball head stepped forward. We good? We all good? Mina and Ochako nodded. We're good, Ochako agreed softly. Okay, good. The little guy looked relieved. Right, let's start over. Hello, I'm France, and welcome to our home. Um, thanks. If you don't mind, what exactly are you guys? because Mina was fairly certain there weren't tiny people living in any of the mini golf courses she'd played on before. Oh, that's simple. We're Lilliputians. Lily, you know, it makes a lot more sense written down, France admitted. And we control the balls, behold. The hole of the windmill opened up. One of the Lilliputians rolled a ball inside, where it slid up a slide and was carried upwards by a tiny bucket, before dropping down through a bunch of gears, the Lilliputians took it from there, directing it through their village before releasing it out the other end, where it rolled smoothly into the hole. That's amazing, Mina told them, still gaping at all the gears. And a bit needlessly complicated, Ochako agreed. Franz waved them off. Aw shucks, it's only our life's work. Would you like to hear about it through song? The Lilliputians all lined up, 
ready to sing. Maybe another time, Mina said hastily. I've still got to practice before my opponent gets here. The Lilliputians had pouted at not being able to sing, but when Mina mentioned an opponent, they perked up, whispering to each other. Franz frowned. So that's what you hugelings are here for. We understand, we know all about opponents. As if on cue, the pirate-themed hole lit up, and more Lilliputians, these ones dressed as pirates, peered over the side of the ship. Put a clog in it, ya yeah windmill lovers, one of them, a Lilliputian with a red golf ball for a face and an eye patch, yelled. That frilly bunch is terrible at controlling the balls. We're the ball masters, says I. Shut your mouths, you showboating pirates, another Lilliputian with a distinctly French accent called out, as the Eiffel Tower hole lit up. Everyone knows Z Eiffel Tower hole is Z best. Stay to your commons, ye Frenchmen. The castle hole now lit up as well, and tiny knights waved mini pencils like swords at the others. None control the balls better than the knights of Weiner Castle. Mina squinted at the graffiti. It looked a lot like Robbie's handiwork. We'll settle which hole is best, France screeched. Attack! The other holes let out similar battle cries, and suddenly the ground around them was filled with tiny people fighting each other. Mina looked on, torn between confusion and amusement. Helplessly, she looked at Ochako, who shrugged, looking just as befuddled, before she stepped forwards, holding up her hands. Guys, guys, calm down. I get that you guys have some sort of feud. What's happening here? We have a great feud indeed, Hugeling, Franz agreed, as the fighting died down. Every hole in the park thinks they're superior, from the cowboys in the east to the grimy miners in the south. If only there was some way to decide which side is best. One of the French Lilliputians stepped forward. But France, look, look at Z sticker. The mood of the Lilliputians shifted, all of them looking up at an increasingly uncomfortable Mina and whispering about the sticker Stan gave her. The sticker, the sticker can decide, France exclaimed. One of the knights knelt down in front of her. Decide for us, Hugeling. Decide which mini kingdom to give the sticker to, and end our war. The rest of the Lilliputians cheered at the idea. Mina winced. As nice as that sounded, she really wasn't sure she wanted to get involved in a weird mini-golf blood feud. Ochako seemed to notice her hesitation. Sorry, can you give us a second, guys? They both turned around. Do you think if we tell them we'll give the sticker to whoever does the best job at sabotaging Pacifica, the windmill guys will let you get that final hole in one? Hmm. It was likely. And while Mina wasn't really one for cheating, the idea of making a fool of the bratty bully was appealing to her. It would be nice comeuppance. I don't know if I want to sabotage my good mini-golf record by cheating, though. This course wouldn't count on your record anyways, because even if we didn't these Lilliputian guys would still be controlling the balls. You can't really have skill on this course anyways. Ochako huffed. Besides, Pacifica's rich. You could say she's cheating at life. Back in the car, Shadow sneezed. You make a compelling argument. They turned back to the tiny fighters. All right, listen up, everyone. The group that does the best at helping me win my own fight with my opponent will win the sticker. A few rules though you can't make it too obvious that you're helping me, and you can't fight between each other. Anyone who does that automatically loses the sticker. The Lilliputians all whispered to each other, before looking back up at the girls. We agree to these terms, Franz said. Let the battle of mini-golf skill begin. How much do you want to bet there are no shows, Pacifica said aloud, as she entered the park. Ochako used the moment to flip on the lights leading to where Mina was standing. Looking for someone, Mina quipped. Pacifica just rolled her eyes. Waiting in the dark, not creepy at all. Speaking of creepy, where's your creepier friend? The one who turns animals into other animals. Waiting for me to tell him all about my victory, Mina snapped back. What about you? It's telling that no one else has shown up for you. Do you even have any real friends? Ochako could see Pacifica tense, even in the dark. I don't know you, you bothered to show up, she said clearly changing the subject. You're not going to win. I wouldn't be so sure if I were you. Are both of you ready? Achako asked, as the two glared at each other. I'll start this game off. Oh, are you getting paid for this? You could probably use the money, Pacifica mocked. Don't punch her in the face, don't punch her in the face. She couldn't wait to see Mina crush the awful brat. 
Ready, set, mini golf. And so the game began. To both Mina and Ochako's delight, every hole was a hole in one for the hero in training, and thankfully, none of them looked impossible or out of place. To Pacifica's horror, every hole she putted went miserably, her balls flying all over the place. In all, things were looking great. So it was a little strange, when, after the fourteenth hole, where they waited a strange amount of time for the miners to go through their hole, Pacifica didn't show up from her refreshment stop to the next round of mini-golf. Do you think she quit and went home? Mina wondered, as the two of them waited. Ochako shrugged. I wouldn't put it past her, although that would be an automatic win for you. A shriek tore through the night. Or something bad happened to her, come on. The two of them ran towards the sound and skidded to a stop in front of the 18th hole. There, Pacifica was tied up, moving slowly towards the windmill, which was moving at record speeds, more than enough to cut her up. In front of them, France stepped out, grinning. Eh? Eh? Do we get the sticker now? Mina looked as horrified as Ochako felt. Debbie, what is this? We're getting rid of your opponent for you, France replied cheerfully. Does that win us the sticker? Hey, what the hell is going on here? Pacifica screamed. Why are there golf ball people? Let me go. Absolutely not, Ochako snapped. We don't want her dead, are you crazy? That's an automatic disqualifier. You didn't say that originally. We thought it was obvious. Well, France sputtered. Decide then, quickly, who gets the sticker? The other Lilliputians closed in. Yahoo! Decide. Big Henry died for this one of the tiny miners called out. Someone what? Okay, miners win. Mina handed them the sticker, and the miners cheered. But that has nothing to do with controlling the ball, lass, one of the pirates argued. It's her decision, Ochako argued back. You asked her to decide, and she did. Now deal with it. She focused on the ropes binding Pacifica, and they undid themselves, the other girl jumping off the death trap. We don't accept this decision, France called out. Sixteen other holes agreeing with him. We should have gotten the sticker. Mina turned nervously to Ochako. You know, I'm starting to think this was always going to be a losing scenario. They wouldn't have accepted any decision we made. Ochako nodded. Seriously, what is all this? Pacifica demanded, as she walked up to join them, looking down at the Lilliputians with wide eyes. What are these things all squeaking about? Kill the hugelings for their transgressions. Pacifica paled considerably at that. Okay, now the tiny living golf balls are squeaking about murder, because this night couldn't get any worse. Mina laughed nervously. Yeah, they wanted me to decide which of them was the best, but now they're angry that I made a decision. She handed Pacifica her club back and gave another to Ochako. You ready to putt? Way ahead of you. The three of them made their way through the mini golf course, swatting away Lilliputians as they did so. The sky rained down sharp pencils, and Ochako batted them away as they ran. Should we get the golf cart? Ochako shook her head. That thing's way too slow. It'll be much faster to run. They made it to the exit, just as the doors shut in front of them. Pacifico looked around them wildly. What do we do now? Hang on, I've got this. Ochako grabbed them all telekinetically and lifted them over the wall, ignoring Pacifica's yell of surprise. They landed safely on the other side and watched as pencils and a swinging axe embedded themselves in the door. Mina tried for a smile. Welp, I'm never coming back here again. Agreed, the other two sympathized. Mina turned to Pacifica with an awkward smile. Hey, I'm really sorry about all that. Those guys were clearly crazy, and we should have realized... The other girl frowned. Yeah, I figured they were helping you win. I'm globally ranked, you know? Even if you didn't want me dead, that was still a jerk move. Constantly insulting me and my friends in front of everyone is also a jerk move, you know? Mina pointed out lightly. Pacifica opened her mouth to retort, but then closed it, saying nothing, eyes downcast. Stan pulled the car around, and Izuku opened the door, taking in their slightly tattered clothing and tired expressions. What happened? The holes were all controlled by tiny golf people who tried to kill us, Mina explained. It was a testament to how long they'd been in Gravity Falls that Izuku easily accepted the answer and scooted over to let them in. 
Mina hesitated before closing the door, before leaning out to address Pacifica. Hey, your parents aren't here. Wanna ride? Machako stared at her, because even after all of that, she still couldn't quite get over Pacifica's treatment of everyone. Pacifica scoffed. Please, as if I would ride with, thunder shook the sky. Pacifica got in the car. They pulled away, and Pacifica squinted at all of them. How are seven people fitting in this car? That doesn't make sense. Stan laughed from the driver's seat. You think I wouldn't get a car that could fit whatever I needed in it? In this place? You're joking. Suze hummed in agreement, and Izuku and Shouto resumed whatever card game they'd been playing while waiting. Izuku offered the three of them cards. You want to play? Achako and Mina both took their hands. Pacifica looked at them weirdly, and Izuku chuckled at her expression. They don't bite? Promise. Fine. Whatever. Eventually they pulled up to Pacifica's house, and she got out. Thanks for the ride, or whatever. And Mina? She paused awkwardly. I can't believe I'm saying this, but, thanks, I had fun. And with that, she walked away towards the gate. You know, Izuku mused, I guess underneath it all, she's just a teenager like us. The gates opened to display peacocks wandering around. A light-up banner congratulating Pacifica shone brightly, and fireworks burst in the sky. Or not. Let's just go home. Agreed. Izuku was just finishing restocking part of the gift shop when Mina nudged him. Check out this unusual sight. She nodded towards Suze, who was looking strangely downcast, drawing circles on the desk with his finger. I don't think I've ever seen him that down. That is unusual, Izuku agreed. For all the time they'd been in Gravity Falls, Suze had for the most part been a perpetual ray of sunshine. It was strange to see him so visibly down about something. It's, ah, not really a big surprise. They turned to see Ochako walking over, wincing. You guys must not have seen it earlier, but Suze was trying to flirt with some girl and got put down. Badly. She frowned. It was extra weird though. Usually, Suze is a lot better with people than that. Now Mina eyes Suze with even more interest. Flirting jitters, then, plenty of people get them. Come on, we should go cheer him up. She made her way over to their co-worker, and Izuku and Ochako followed behind. As soon as Suze noticed them, he perked up a bit, masking his disappointment with a smile Izuku would have thought as genuine if he didn't know the man better. Hey dudes, how can I help you? Don't suppose you're having any girl issues lately? Mina offered lightly. We could help if you are. She gestured to the three of them, but mainly to herself and Ochako, which Izuku was perfectly fine with, considering his own lack of experience with dating. Suze visibly sagged. Guess you dudes saw that, huh? Yeah, my cousin Reggie is getting married soon, and my abuela asked me to find someone to take to his engagement party. But I don't know the first thing about girls, or dating. Ochako patted Suze's shoulder sympathetically. That's your first problem, Suze. You're a great guy, and a lot of fun to be around. Good people will naturally come to you. You've just got to stop thinking of women as potential dates and start thinking about them as potential friends that you get to spend extra time with. Definitely, Izuku chimed in. You should have seen me the first time I really talked to a girl. More than just simple sentences. I mean, you know, since I really wasn't talking to many kids my age since they wanted to avoid me because he trailed off, chuckling awkwardly. And anyways, I was a stuttering mess the first time I really talked to a girl I found cute. It's super normal, you've just gotta get over that hurdle. Awa, you were stuttering over a crush? Mina teased. That's cute. It's hard to imagine, Ochako said, hopefully oblivious to the warmth spreading in Izuku's cheeks as he realized what he was saying and who he was saying it in front of. I mean, you're so sweet and approachable, Deku. And now his face was totally super red. Um, thanks. Mina's eyes shifted between Izuku and Ochako, a grin slowly forming on her face, before she turned back to the matter at hand. Anyways, Suze, see, you're totally not alone in these feelings. Thankfully, Suze seemed at least somewhat relieved. That does make me feel better, knowing you felt the same way. I guess I just don't want to let my abuela down. You guys know she raised me for as long as I can remember. Izuku winced at that, because yeah, they knew all about Sue's lack of parents, and Izuku could completely understand not wanting to let down the most important family member in his life. 
It's good to hear that cheered you up. But really, I don't think you need to worry so much. You've just gotta be you, and I'm sure you'll find someone. You're such a great guy. And even if you don't, going stag won't be awful, Achako insisted. We could even come along with you so you'll have friends, if that would make you feel better. Then your abuela and cousin can see that you're successful and have a lot of good people around you who like you a lot. Slowly, the stress seemed to fade from Sue's face as he looked at the three heroes warmly. Thanks dudes, you guys are the best. He wrung his hands. I guess I'm still a little nervous about the whole thing though. Then let's spend some time taking your mind off of it, Mina suggested. We can go to the arcade, or the mall, or that animatronic place, or wherever you want. Seeing Suze perk up at the idea, she grinned, bounced on the balls of her feet, and sprinted away. I'll grab Shouto. Okay, I'll tell Mr. Pines we're heading out. Suze walked over to their employer, looking much happier, and leaving Izuku and Ochako alone together. There was a moment of silence before Ochako spoke. So, who was the girl you were so flustered over? There was levity in her smile, but Izuku still wanted to melt into the floor. He sorely wished he could have Blendon's time machine back, if only to erase that part of the conversation. Um, funny story actually, haha. -ha. Oh his face was so red, this was a disaster. You know, um. She looked at him, confused, and Izuku buried his head in his hands. It was kinda, you? I mean, you're very pretty and nice, and then you saved me from falling before the test, and then again at the entrance exam and it took me a while to work up the courage to actually talk to you, so. Oh, Ochako's voice sounded a little strangled. Izuku peered through his hands and wondered if he was imagining the blush on her face. That's, wow, I don't think anyone said that before. Um, I mean, you saved me too, in the exam, and you're super nice and smart, thanks. The two of them stood there for a moment, red-faced, in awful silence. Ochako cleared her throat and smiled at him. Wanna help Suze convince Stan to let us leave work early? Izuku took the olive branch. Yeah, that sounds like a good idea. In the end, they decided to head to the mall, to get some cheap but fun food at the food court and play some fun games they had in some of the shops. The burden on Suze's shoulders seemed to lighten the longer they stayed, so Mina considered the trip a success. She also kept an eye on Izuku and Ochako, because there definitely seemed to be some blushing going on there. It was absolutely adorable, and Mina quickly decided that was one pairing she'd be very happy to see. Don't you think they'd be cute together? She whispered, nudging Shouto and motioning towards their fellow mystery crew members. He blinked at them, as Izuku challenged Suze, frowning. Aren't they too young for Suze? Not with Suze, together. Come on, don't tell me you didn't see those red faces. He shrugged. I wasn't really paying attention to how red their faces were, Sorry. You're no fun. Mina Mock pouted, but straightened as the two separated from Suze to join them back at the table. Suze wants to go on that little train ride, but it's a one-person thing, Izuku explained, sitting down. So, we can focus on lunch. Operation Cheer Suze Up is turning out to be a big success, Ochako said happily, stealing one of Shouto's fries and biting off the end. Do you guys hear him say when the engagement party's going to be? Hopefully it's soon, so we can keep our promise and don't miss it. Yeah, right? Something churned in Mina's gut. For a few hours, she realized she had forgotten they would be leaving as soon as they possibly could. That the less time they were stuck in this world, the better. It was so silly. They hadn't even been here for two months, and she was already growing attached to the place and everyone there. How had their lives changed so quickly? There was a long stretch of silence that nobody seemed to want to break, all of them contemplating their quick agreement to attend Sue's cousin's wedding if he couldn't find a date, and just how much that meant they were settling into this world. Everyone except for Shouto, apparently, who had noticed something else. Guys, Sue's is talking to a girl, and they look like they're having a lot of fun together. Mina jerked up, looking at the little train ride, Sure enough, Suze was in deep conversation with a nice-looking lady who seemed to run a meat stand. Both of them looked like they were thoroughly enjoying themselves. Oh, this is great, let's go. No way, Ochako grabbed her arm. We've gotta wait until they're done talking. We shouldn't spoil the moment. As much as Mina wanted to meet the new mystery woman, 
She reluctantly agreed, sitting back down. Eventually, the woman walked away, and Mina sprang out of her chair, jogging over, the other three following behind her. Suze? Suze grinned at them, delighted. Guys, I think I got a date. Her name is Melody, and she's super cool. Her stand is even called Meet Cute, and that's adorable. And she thinks people of all ages can enjoy kids' stuff. And she likes hoo-ha owls jamboree. She sounds amazing, Suze, Mina encouraged. Did you ask her to go with you to the party? Suze shrugged awkwardly. Uh, not yet? I did invite her to hoo-ha owls jamboree though, and I guess that's sort of a date. Sort of? It's definitely a date, Ochako confirmed. That's probably good, not asking her to come right off the bat. You've got to wait a little bit, spend some time together first. And even if it doesn't work out as a date, you can still invite her along as a friend. Yeah, you're right, Suze agreed. I just can't help but be nervous. What if our date goes badly? What if she decides she hates me? From what you've said, she doesn't sound like the type, Shouto offered. Not that I would really know. I'm probably the last person anyone should ask for dating advice. From the sound of his voice, he seemed a bit confused as to why he'd been dragged out here in the first place. We could go to the Jamboree place that same night, you know, for moral support, Izuku suggested. I've never been there, it could be fun. Suze smiled with relief. Would you? Ah, uh, thanks dudes, that would be great. We'll be there, Mina promised. You didn't tell me about the animatronics. Come on, Mina huffed, dragging Shouto in by the arm. They're not gonna bite. We're doing this for Suze, remember? I remember the last time we had to deal with odd humanoid figures. They were wax sculptures, they were very creepy, and they tried to murder us. These aren't haunted statues though, Izuku pointed out. They're newly made machines, they're not haunted. Ochako was frowning, however. Wasn't there that really old video game about murderous animatronics? Where they either thought you were supposed to be in a suit, or were possessed by ghost kids, or something. Not all horror tropes are real. Even as Mina said it, there was a nervousness that was starting to form in Izuku's gut. He looked around, taking note of the different groups of families and friends that were occupying the restaurant and play space. It was pretty sparsely populated at the moment, although Izuku was pretty sure he saw Robbie in some corner of the restaurant. One of the workers approached them. Table for four. Yes, please. They were seated close to Suze and Melody, with Izuku sitting next to Ochako. There was still a little rush of embarrassment when he thought about their earlier conversation, but he shoved it down. Ochako was a great friend now, and he wasn't going to let a small crush get in the way of that. The night actually passed pretty peacefully, the four of them chatting and keeping an eye on Sue's date, which seemed to be going very well, although Shadow still edged away from any passing animatronics. Then the lights shut out. A power outage, Ochako wondered, her amulet glowing slightly to give them some light. On the TVs in front of them, a pixelated girl with pink hair appeared, smiling down. Hello, Robbie. In the corner, Robbie jerked back, looking at the screen in abject horror. You aren't really rejecting me, are you? The smiling AI continued. You know real girls will always only break your heart. You should stay with me, R. Well, this got disturbing fast. Shadow leapt to his feet turning to Suze and Melody as some of the other customers started to flee in confusion and terror. Suze, Melody, you should continue somewhere else. We can handle this. Are you sure? Suze asked, clearly hesitant to leave. Melody blinked. What's going on? Who is that figure on the screen? In the corner of his vision, Izuku could see Robbie pointing at the screen and yelling something that only seemed to anger the digital girl more. Rogue AI, probably, Ochako offered. Not the first time we've dealt with game characters coming to life. You know, you never told us what that was about, Mina noted lightly, pulling out her grappling hook. It was the incident that put that dent in the water tower. Without elaborating further, Shouto gestured towards the doors. Seriously, we can handle this. Finally, Suze nodded. All right, let's find somewhere a bit safer to eat, yeah? Apparently giving up on understanding the situation, Melody shrugged. Fine with me. With that out of the way, the four ran over to Robbie's side. What's going on? None of your business. 
it was a testament to how uncomfortable the older teenager was that he caved after one sharp look from the mystery crew. Okay, I bought a dating sim to help me get over Wendy. I didn't know Jiffany would jump out of the game and stalk me in real life. It's not stalking, Robbie. There was a burst of electricity, and suddenly the animatronic's eyes were lighting up red, and Jiffany's voice was coming out of them. You're my new boyfriend. I'm just making sure you don't go with some other girl. You promised we would be together forever, remember? In the game, Robbie protested feebly, and I wasn't even flirting with Tambry. Do not speak her name. Jiffany lifted an animatronic arm, electrifying the other robots. Capture Robbie. Oh no you don't, Ochako lifted one of the robots in the air and smashed it against the wall. The rest of them were quick to follow, Izuku darting towards the owl robot and slicing it with his dagger like a knife through warm butter, taking its head off. Next to him, Mina shot her grappling hook at the gopher, before reeling it back and tearing it apart by doing so. On the other side of him, another animatronic melted under the force of blue flames. I really feel like, I told you so is appropriate here, Shadow remarked. You're never getting me in one of these places again. Yeah yeah, you can brag about it later. Mina rolled her eyes, dodging ball pit and ball toss balls that Jiffany sent towards them at lightning speeds. You okay, Robbie? Robbie looked at the mayhem surrounding him, obviously in a total panic. What the hell is going on? Yeah, sorry about the mess. An idea struck Izuku. Hey, do you have the disc she came on? We could burn it, see if that would destroy her. Jiffany's robot body stiffened. No, it wouldn't. Do not destroy that disc. You mean this one? Robbie pulled a small disc out of his hoodie pocket. Not sure why I brought it with me here, but sure. Maybe your fire friend can melt it. Shadow winced. Probably not the best idea. My fire can be chaotic. Something worse might happen. It's literally fire. How bad could it be? It's not whatever. Shouto shrugged and took the disc from Robbie's hands. Anyone know where the pizza ovens in this place are? I'll lead you there. The group followed Robbie, knocking, dodging, and slicing their way through the robots and projectiles that tried to block their path. Here's the oven. Come now, Robbie, Jiffany said, approaching them. Will this really change anything? You think any real girl would like you after this? Stay with me, Robbie. I won't reject you like Tambry. I won't abandon you like that heartless girl Wendy did. At that, suddenly Robbie stiffened and his eyes narrowed. Don't talk about Wendy like that. With that, he slammed the disc in the still heated oven. Jiffany screamed, then her screams turned to static-filled shrieks as the face of the animatronic she was possessing melted and she slowly broke down leaving the five of them staring at the absolute mess that was left of the jamboree. Well, Izuku hedged softly. At least Sue's date went well. You're serious, Robbie snorted. That fat weird man-child got a date, and all I got was a murderous dating sim. Mina glared at the other boy. Insult Sue's again, and I'll shove you against the oven. Robbie put his hands up, clearly intimidated. Okay, okay, jeez. Shouto rubbed his forehead. Can we go home now? I want to get something better to eat, and also mention again about how I totally called it. Ochako let out a little laugh. Yeah, you totally did. Let's go home. Stan, why are you getting in a cab with that creepy golden statue? Izuku asked nervously. Oh, Goldie saved my life from an evil badger robot, so we're going to Vegas together, Stan insisted, grinning. The four of them just stared at him blankly. Oh, okay. Please don't spend all our money. Don't worry about that. And with that he was off. He's gonna waste all our money, Mina guessed. It's all good, I hid most of his cash before he left, Ochako informed them. Poker, anyone? Hey, check this out. The other three mystery crew members turned as Ochako bounded into the attic, holding up a dirty green bottle like some sort of prize. It's a bottle message from Mermando. It just floated up from the pool and it has our names on it. She turned the bottle, showing hers and Mina's names etched into it. Mina perked up, grinning, and the boys scooted over curiously. Really? How's he doing? Did he make it back to the ocean? Let's see. Ochako popped open the bottle and pulled out the roll of paper inside, looking it over with wide eyes. Okay, good news is, he got back home. 
The other news is, he's in an arranged marriage now to the Queen of the Manatees in order to prevent an undersea civil war. She held up a picture that had come with the letter, showing Mermando swimming awkwardly in a crown, holding a trident, next to a manatee in a pink dress with a different crown on her head. Mina winced. He doesn't look so happy about it. I mean, at least he's not stuck in a pool. But... That sucks, Izuku sympathized. Maybe you should send him a bottle back. He might want some pen pals to help him get through this. Ochako nodded, determined. Definitely. At least we should try. Mina looked outside the attic. Well, it's late afternoon now, so maybe we should send him a message tomorrow morning. I don't know how fast it'll reach the ocean, though. It's worth a shot anyways, Shadow said, and the two girls nodded. Not like we have much else to do. It's been a slow couple days, and we're still not any closer to figuring out more about the author. He glanced over at the broken laptop, still sitting in the corner of the room. It's a little frustrating, Izuku admitted, looking up at their cork board. It feels like every time we think we might get closer, we hit another dead end. Yeah, and while Ochako wasn't sure exactly what her friends were thinking about that, it was personally a little nerve-wracking. Going to Sue's cousin's wedding had been a lot of fun, but it had also been a sobering reminder of just how long they'd been in Gravity Falls. The longer time went on without any contact from their world, the more Ochako was starting to lose hope that the pros could find them at all. Their only option might be to find a way home themselves, possibly through talking to the mysterious author of the journals, but that wasn't working out either. And the longer they stayed, the more like, well home gravity falls felt. Which was nice, in a way, but it also showed just how far out of reach their dreams of being heroes were drifting. Ochako played with the green bottle in her hands, looking at the old, broken laptop. Then, seized by a sudden, strange idea, she walked over to it and lifted the green bottle to her eye. What are you doing? Izuku asked curiously, as Ochako scanned the laptop through the magnified bottom of the bottle, until it landed on something that made her heart leap in her chest. Guys, I found a clue. Look! She handed the bottle to Izuku and pointed where to look, watching as his face lit up when he found what she had. Inside a smashed up part of the computer was a label. The metal had rusted, but the words could still be read clearly McGucket Labs. Izuku reeled back. McGucket Labs, as in Fiddleford McGucket, Mina and Shadow rushed over, and he passed the bottle off to them. And I noticed after we first got it that the laptop said, Property of F. It doesn't look like any normal laptop, even in this world, but McGucket has built a lake monster and that Gideon bot, so it wouldn't be too far-fetched for him to make a laptop of his own design. But why would it be in the bunker unless... McGucket was the author, Shadow finished softly. Or he worked with the author, at the very least. Whatever the case is, he might know something. He frowned. But at some point in the past, he clearly went insane. Will he be able to tell us what he knows? It's worth a shot, Mina encouraged. It's the best lead we've had since getting the laptop. We've got to follow up on it. Hope blossomed in Ochako's chest and she could see it reflected in her friend's eyes. We've held off our investigations for a while, she said. Maybe it's time to pick them up again. One by one, they all turned to Shouto, who was looking at the laptop with a mix of emotions. Yeah, I think so, he finally murmured. At least it wasn't a total loss. I didn't screw it up completely. Of course you didn't, Izuku insisted. We still don't blame you for that. Let's update the conspiracy board, Ochako rearranged their board and gave the laptop spot a little more space, placing McGucket's picture under it. She then sorted through all of their other information related to the old hillbilly. Her eyes settled on one picture in particular, with the man's hand completely wrapped in bandages. You don't think? Him having a sixth finger that's now gone might be a little too far-fetched, Izuku offered. He told us a story about how he kissed a raccoon, and then we watched him get swallowed by a dinosaur. Shouto pointed out reasonably. He begs for attention by making giant robots. Nothing about him is far-fetched. That's a fair point. We'll need to find McGucket and ask him ourselves, Mina decided. She grabbed the laptop and Izuku scooped up his journal, and they headed downstairs, where Suze and Wendy were still working, as some song blared in the background. Am I Blanchin? Girl, we Blanchin. I live up in a mansion. 
Suze hummed along as Wendy looked just about ready to tear out her hair. Ugh, this song is so awful. Blanchin isn't a thing. Rappers can't just make up words, the older girl complained. Dude, Shakespeare made up tons of words, Suze retorted. That's just what visionaries do. We've got a mission, guys, Mina called out as they headed past them. We're going to find McGucket, we'll explain why on the way. Um, sure, confused but intrigued, the two Mystery Shack employees followed them, ignoring Stan's cry about how they still needed to work. The six of them headed towards the junkyard McGucket could usually be found in, and Izuku gave a rushed explanation of what they had discovered, to Sue's and Wendy's shock. McGucket, Wendy repeated, disbelieving. Seriously? Shadow shrugged. We thought the same, but even if he wasn't the author, he was definitely involved. They entered the junkyard, looking around for signs of the older man. McGucket, Achako called out. Are you here? Here, hillbilly billy billy, Suze added, his voice echoing around the yard as they passed through massive scrap piles, eventually arriving at the old man's small shanty in the center, where Nate and Lee were snickering and spray painting the walls. Seconds later, McGucket emerged, brandishing a stick and charging after the older teens, who laughed as they ran away. McGucket was clearly less amused. Get out of here, you salt licking, horns woggling, he trailed off and sighed, looking at the spray painted message. McSuck it, they got me good right there. Izuku cleared his throat awkwardly and walked forwards, the rest of them behind him. McGucket, do you remember us from that pterodactyl incident? McGucket's eyes landed on them at Izuku's words, and he lit up. Visitors, come, come, pull up some rusty metal. He led them into his shanty, and with a bit of hesitance, they all followed, looking around at the cramped and dirty space filled with all sorts of junk. You're just in time for my hourly turf war with the hillbilly that lives in my mirror. He turned to his reflection shining on the side of his tub and glared. Quit staring at me while I bathe. Ochako winced. Hopefully he isn't the author. I don't think there's much information we can get from him. Still, they had to try. Izuku cleared his throat awkwardly to try again. McGucket, does this journal, or this laptop, ring any bells for you? You made the laptop, and you might have written the journal. We wanted to know if you could tell us anything about them. I still can't believe he might be the genius these guys have been looking for all along, Wendy muttered to Suze, as she pulled the broken laptop out of the bag they'd stuffed it in. Despite her lowered tone of voice, McGucket clearly heard her, as he sagged at her words. Probably not, fellers. I'm no genius. I've never done nothing worthwhile in my life. Everyone knows I'm no good to nobody. Ochako opened her mouth to point out that it would probably take a genius to make the inventions McGucket had made, but she was stopped short when he added, I can't remember what I used to be, but I know I must have been a big failure to end up like this. Really? Shouto leaned forwards. You can't remember? The laptop has your name on it, Suze insisted. You really don't know anything about it. Maybe it could jog your memory, Izuku suggested, holding out the journal and flipping through the pages. McGucket's eyes followed the images in front of him, but no recollection seemed to stir within his mind. I told ya, I don't recall, McGucket insisted. Everything before 1982 is just a blur. Just a hazy. The pages settled on one image in particular, showing a man in a red robe, as well as an image of an eye that was crossed out with red. Upon seeing this, McGucket let out a shriek and stumbled backwards. Ah, the blind eye, the robes, the men, my mind, they did something. All of them startled at his exclamation. What do you mean? Ochako asked, a little nervously. Who did that to you? I, I, McGucket stammered. I don't recall. He rubbed his head, as if trying to jog the memories. Mina winced. Whatever you saw or learned, these red robes guys must not have liked. Maybe not them, but someone or something else, and they messed with your mind because of it. Considering those red robes are in the book though, it's probably them. Who were those people anyways? McGucket simply shook his head, which was the answer Ochako had suspected. If they'd gone to the trouble of tampering with the old man's memory, they weren't going to leave their identities in his head. If we can help him remember, Shouto trailed off, thinking. McGucket, what's the very first thing you can remember? McGucket frowned, before taking a newspaper clipping off of the metal wall and showing it to them. This is, I think. 
Ochako scanned over the article, titled, Disoriented Man Found at Museum, Sent Packing. The History Museum, then? We can start looking there, Izuku decided. All in agreement, they hopped into Sue's car, McGucket riding excitedly in the trunk. Sue's turned on the music, and a familiar rap belted out. Am I Blanchin? Girl, we Blanchin. I live up in a mansion. Ugh, Sue's. Wendy slammed the button to release the CD, grabbing it and flinging it out of the car like it was a frisbee. At the look Sue's gave her, she winced. I'll buy you a new one. Is it just me? Or does this place look a lot spookier than the last time we visited? Mina wondered, as the seven of them crept through a window and into the museum. And that time there were cops following us around. I think we were in a different wing of the museum last time, Shouto said. It was a lot more open as well, more artwork and less, he gestured to the totem poles and taxidermized animals that filled out the wing of the museum they'd entered. Everyone, keep your eyes peeled for clues. Crossed out eyes, red robes, that sort of thing, Wendy said quietly, as the group started to wander around. Guys, look, Izuku turned to where Suze was pointing, and spotted the shadow of a robed figure darting into a room down the hall. Follow him, they ran after the figure, before coming to a stop in what seemed to be a completely closed-off room, filled entirely with different eyes, and a roaring fireplace. Well, kettle my corn, he vinishified, McGucket mused. Wendy snorted. Where do you come up with this stuff, McGucket? Is that just hillbilly vocab? Nope, just me. Well, the eyes are familiar, Shouto mused as they looked around. But where did he go? A secret passage, maybe, Mina offered. McGucket frowned. I don't like this place. Feels like all the eyes are a-watching me. Izuku looked at McGucket's place in the room, then at all the different eyeballs and their positions, and things clicked. Wait, they are. Can you move aside for a moment? McGucket did so, and behind him was a piece of rubble, shaped like a triangle, with a familiar-looking symbol behind it. Izuku pressed on the stone, and it shifted, moving backwards. A moment later, there was a soft rumbling noise, and the fireplace slid sideways, revealing a small passageway down. Wendy grinned. Jackpot. Secret passageway it is. We'll have to be stealthy, McGucket insisted. I'll hambone a message if there's trouble. He then proceeded to slap his arms, legs and head in a strange pattern. I have no clue what that means, sorry, Izuku admitted. Also, weren't you the one who screamed when we were trying to be quiet around the pterodactyl? Suze pointed out, rather reasonably. That was different, without explaining why one scenario required stealth and the other didn't in his mind. McGucket strode forwards towards the passageway, and the rest of them followed ducking under the low ceiling and creeping forward at a slow and even pace. At the bottom were two red curtains, and beyond them, Izuku could hear chanting. They reached the curtains and pulled them back a little bit, peering inside the room ahead. It was in fact a meeting of red robes, six of them, with the crossed-out eye symbol on the hoods of their robes, standing around a small table upon which a tiny chest stood. They all touched the chest and then backed away, and one in particular stepped forwards. Who is the subject of our meeting, he asked, in a voice Izuku didn't recognize. Two more robed figures entered their view, with lazy Susan between them, a burlap bag over her head. This woman, they announced, taking the bag off her head, and strapping her to a chair just outside the circle of figures. What is it that you have seen, the one robe, possibly the leader, asked. Speak, the others chanted. To Izuku's surprise, Lazy Susan didn't seem all that worried about being kidnapped and tied to a chair, merely confused. Uh, well, uh, I was leaving the dinner, and, and I saw these little bearded doodads, and I was like, what? The gnomes? But they'd all seen the gnomes around Gravity Falls plenty of times before. Izuku looked at his friends, and saw they were just as confused as he was. There, there. You won't be like, wa for much longer, the head robe said, as he opened the chest and pulled out a strange-looking object, like a gun, but with a light bulb instead of a barrel. The other robes tightened their hoods. What is that gizmo? Lazy Susan asked. It looks like a hairdryer. Are you guys barbers? Without answering, the robe put some words into the device and aimed it at her. A blue light shot out, hitting Lazy Susan in the face. She screamed and twitched, but then the light faded, and she simply stared. Lazy Susan, what do you know of little bearded men? The robe asked. 
My mind is clear, thanks to the Society of the Blind Eye, Lazy Susan replied in a monotonous tone. The robes raised their arms to the ceiling. It is unseen. Oh shit, these guys are cultists, Mina finally said. And they have an actual memory eraser, Shouto added quietly. Which explains why McGucket can't remember anything, especially if they're erasing memories of supernatural events. Do you think our memories have been erased? Wendy asked nervously. The group all looked at one another. They've been erasing memories of the supernatural, but we still remember all the supernatural things we've seen, Izuku noted. Also, we've been pretty much keeping track of the days since we got here, so we'd probably know if we missed anything. Quietly, they all breathed a sigh of relief, watching as the cultists untied Lazy Susan's arms. Lazy Susan, how do you feel? The head cultist asked. The dinner owner smiled. I feel great, I can't even remember what was wrong, or what I'm doing here, or if I'm a man or a woman. Izuku glanced at McGucket as the cultists led the woman away. If a blast from that memory gun could remove so much when the intention was only to erase the gnomes. McGucket's disorderly state of mind was making a lot of sense. Your memories will be safe with us, the leader said, taking a tube out of the memory gun and writing Lazy Susan's name on it. Hidden in the Hall of the Forgotten, he sent the tube into a long, large, glass tube, and it zoomed away into another room. Into the Hall of the Forgotten. Into the Hall of the Forgotten. Nice chanting lads, have you been practicing lately? The tube disappeared, and the leader announced, meeting adjourned. They watched as the cultists separated, telling each other, unsee you later, and Izuku took a deep breath, before turning to the other six. McGucket's memories might be in the Hall of the Forgotten, we should check there for them. With all the cultists dispersed, the seven of them hesitantly entered the room. Izuku hesitantly picked up the gun, noting the different input and output mechanisms on it. Even if they were just there to get McGucket's memories, it seemed wrong to leave this in the hands of the cultists. Some of us should stay here in case they come back, Wendy said aloud, as she examined the chair Lazy Susan had been strapped to. Girls stay on lookout, boys go look for the memories. That's fine. Works for me. Izuku nodded his own agreement, and then hurried off with Shouto, Suze, and McGucket. Following the long tube the memory capsule had been put in, it led out into the museum, and so they walked quietly through the halls, pausing to hide behind exhibits when a couple of cultists passed by them. At one point, they had to slide down the tube through a narrow drop, but it evened out, and they found themselves in front of a door with the red cross I painted on it. Shouto opened the door, and the four of them stepped inside, looking around with wide eyes. The entire room was filled with little mountains of memory capsules, stacked almost as tall as Izuku, with a few capsules that were apparently special standing upright on a statue at the other end of the room. Izuku wandered in, looking at all the different names. Despite being almost certain they hadn't had their memories erased, he kept an eye out for his and his friends' names. Honey Focalin Salt Licking Skulduguri, McGucket hissed, and Izuku found himself agreeing with Wendy he kind of wanted to learn more of McGucket's weird phrases. Pacifica, Robbie, that reporter woman, Gideon's mother, there's so many people who've been memory wiped. Shouto stiffened, and then turned to Izuku. If the memory gun did this to McGucket, do you think part of the reason gravity falls is, like this, is because people's minds are constantly being addled? That's, oh my god, that's a possibility, Izuku admitted, feeling a cold pit settle in his stomach. He swallowed nervously. McGucket's memories aside, we can't let this keep happening. Who knows how much worse the town might get. Taking down cults is probably a good idea in general, but yeah, Shouto agreed. I haven't seen any of our names on these capsules, have you? Izuku shook his head, relieved. I think we're safe, for now. But if they hadn't discovered the Society of the Blind Eye now, how much longer would the cult have waited before trying to erase their memories as well? It was a terrifying thought. At least they'd discovered the cult first. Looky, fellers. It's those words what people call me, McGucket announced proudly, pointing to one of the special-looking capsules. Sure enough, Fiddleford McGucket was written on it. Dude, your memories, Suze exclaimed, setting down whatever memory capsule he was looking at. McGucket scampered up the statue and plucked the capsule from its stand. Grabby grabby, I've got it. The eye carving above him swiveled and lit up. They must have had a sensor on it, 
Izuku realized, reaching for his dagger. Come on, let's get the girls. Before they could move, robed men burst into the room, running for them. Instinctively, Izuku blasted them away with his dagger, sending them flying. Shouto didn't waste a second, running over and knocking the cultists down as they tried to get to their feet, and Izuku and Suze joined him. The cultists weren't bad, but they also had no magic, no training, and weren't expecting the trespassers to fight back. Suze ran after one cultist, yelling and brandishing capsules like a weapon, while McGucket cackled as he slammed a banjo he'd gotten from only he knew where down on another's head. What should we do with them now? Suze wondered, as they looked down at the unconscious cultists. Take them back to the main room, Shouto suggested. If the girls got attacked, they also probably knocked out their cultists. He paused. We'll have to drag them, though. I'm not risking using my fire. Izuku, Suze, and McGucket agreed, and dragged the four unconscious figures back to the first room, where Wendy, Ochako, and Mina were busy tying up the other robed figures they'd seen. Ochako noticed them first, waving brightly. Glad you guys are okay. Hang on, I got them. With that, she floated the other cultists over and tied them up as well, dusting off her hands. All right, want to see who these guys are under their hoods? Definitely. Shouto lifted up a hood and squinted. The tattooed bouncer from that bar we went to once. Mina blinked in surprise as she revealed another figure. The guy who married a woodpecker? Oh, and this is the guy who tried to burn me for being a witch in one of those timelines where we lost waddles. Wendy shot her a concerned look at that, but she just shrugged it off. Toby determined. Izuku then paused to consider the man in front of him. Actually, that makes a lot of sense. So does Bud Gleeful, Achako said, motioning to Gideon's father, whose hood she'd pulled up. Either he erases memories to help Gideon, or to try and forget all the things Gideon's done. Then she winced. That's kinda sad, actually. Who is this guy? Wendy wondered, pointing to the robed cultist who had been the leader. He was bald, with extremely pale skin, and sections of the brain filled in with generic words tattooed in blue on his forehead. I've never seen him around before. Or maybe you've forgotten, Suze suggested. Or he's just shy. As he was saying this, the leader started to groan, opening his eyes. Oh, hey, cult leader dude, what's your name? What? The man noticed his bindings, struggling in vain against them. I am Blind Ivan, and you will release me from these bindings. How dare you disturb the sanctum of the blind eye in such a manner? Why are you even doing this? Izuku asked. Why are you erasing people's memories around town? Blind Ivan glared at him. If you must know, shack worker, it's because Gravity Falls is a terrifying place filled with horrifying things. The people had no peace of mind, no way to fight off the supernatural. So our founder invented the next best thing a way to forget. We help Gravity Falls citizens go about their happy lives. You messed up McGucket's head so bad he lives in a junkyard and yells at his reflection, Shouto said shortly. You might have been contributing to the fact that most people in Gravity Falls can't seem to think much at all. You're not helping people, you're lobotomizing them. Blind Ivan waved his words away. Multiple uses on one person might have side effects, yes, but it's much better than the alternative. At this point, others were beginning to wake up, gasping and trying to free themselves. Wendy shook her head at his words. One thing I still don't get though why haven't you erased our memories then? Yeah, our names weren't on any of the capsules in the Hall of the Forgotten, Izuku mused. And Stan wasn't there either. The cult leader grimaced at the name. It was one of our founding principles. We were to stay away from the mystery shack, for the things there would take far too much to unsee. This perked all of their interests, but Ivan just continued on. But now, you've challenged us first. The society won't forget this. Izuku looked at the memory gun in his hands, then at the others, who seemed to get what he was thinking. It's probably for the best, Mina offered so they can't hurt anyone else. Right? Izuku took a deep breath and imputed Society of the Blind Eye into the memory gun. Then he held it up to the cultists. These guys lobotomized the town, like Shouto said. This is to prevent them from doing it again. He smiled. Say cheese. Thank you for visiting the museum for Gold Miner Appreciation Night, Izuku said cheerfully as the former cultists gave their tips to Magakit. 
Be sure to tip the gold miner on your way out. You know, Izuku admitted, after the last memory wiped cultist had left. That might have been the most morally gray thing we've done, after accidentally getting Blendon sent to prison. Not like we had much of a choice, Wendy pointed out gently. No way would the police believe us, probably cause their memories have been wiped too. It was a sobering thought, one that had them all standing there silently for a moment. Mina coughed. So, wanna go see what's in McGucket's memory capsule? There was something we could play memories in, back in the Hall of the Forgotten, Shadow noted. Let's head there. They went back into the museum, reaching the Hall of the Forgotten, where the memory viewing machine sat, waiting for something to be inserted. McGucket approached it with his memories, then hesitated. I'm not so sure about this, fellers. What, what if I don't like what I see? Then at least you'll know for sure, Mina encouraged. Go on. Carefully, McGucket placed his memories in the machine. It stuttered, status, and then came to life, with the image of a brown-haired man wearing glasses, standing in front of a bunch of blueprints on wormholes. There was a small plant on the drawer behind him, and he was wearing a nice suit. My name is Fiddleford Hadron McGucket, and I wish to unsee what I have seen. Mina gasped. The on-screen McGucket ran a hand through his hair. For the past year, I have been working as an assistant for a visiting researcher. He has been cataloging his findings of Gravity Falls in a series of journals. Mina glanced over to see Izuku looking down at the journal in his hands. I helped him build a machine which he believed had the potential to benefit all mankind. But something went wrong. I decided to quit the project, but I lie awake at night, haunted by the thoughts of what I've done. I believe I have invented a machine that can permanently erase these memories from my mind. Test Subject 1, Fiddleford Mina winced as the machine went off, horror and understanding dawning upon her. Next to her, Ochako covered her mouth, and Shadow tensed. The scene changed, showing Fiddleford again. It worked, I can't recall a thing. Then again. Now, in the background, eyes were being scribbled out, handprints were on the wall, and the young plant was clearly dying. I call it the Society of the Blind Eye. We will help those who want to forget by erasing their bad memories. Then again, more crossed-out eyes on the walls, one of the chalkboards had fallen and smashed into the drawer and plant beneath it, and the word help was written in what Mina sincerely hoped was red paint. Today I came across a colony of what looked like little men very disturbing. I would like to forget seeing this. I accidentally hit another car in town today. I felt very tea terrible tea terrible. I've been forgetting words lately. I wonder if there are any negative side effects of... I saw something in the lake. Something big. My hair's been a fallen out. So I got this hat from a scarecrow. Hey, are my pants on backwards? The last scene was of McGucket as he was now, cackling merrily and spouting nonsense, jumping around the screen and holding his fingers around his eye in a triangle shape. The screen cut out. For a moment, they all just stood there in stunned silence, as it sunk in that they had just watched a man degrade into insanity. Mina looked at said man now, standing in front of the screen, and all she could think to say was, Oh, McGucket. McGucket walked forward, retrieving his capsule. Then he turned to face them with a smile and an unusual amount of clarity. Ah, oh, hush. You kids helped me get my memories back, just like you said. That's still thirty years gone, Shadow trailed off. Maybe I can't get all those years back, McGucket agreed. But now that I finally know who I was, I can begin to put myself back together again. He tapped out a sincere message that Mina still couldn't understand. If if you remember anything about the author, Izuku began hesitantly. Then he shook his head. We were hoping we could find a way home, but I don't want to push you. I'm glad you've got your memories back, at least. If I do remember anything, I'll let you kids know, McGucket promised, trying out some glasses that were laying around. I still don't recall who the author was, or what it was we were a-working on, but maybe that could help you guys out. I'll tell ya if I do. Thank you, Mina said, sincerely. It was hard to be completely cheerful, as they headed back to Sue's car. Not after what they'd seen, but they'd defeated a group of cultists, helped someone regain their memories, and taken what might possibly have been the biggest step towards getting home. If that wasn't a success, Mina didn't know what was. So, what's this about a magical river? Ochako asked, as the four members of the mystery crew strolled through the woods. 
Izuku flipped through the pages of the journal. Apparently, it's got strange properties that not even the author totally figured out. We've got some time until the Woodstick Festival I figured we could check it out. Apparently, the Woodstick Festival was held annually in Gravity Falls, featuring up-and-coming indie bands. Shouto had never been to a concert before, but the crew had been invited by Wendy and her friends, and he was excited to see what the hype was all about. Does this river have a name, or is it just called Magical River? Mina wondered aloud, as they finally came upon their destination. The river in question was definitely off-looking, seeming to glow ever so slightly, the water a bit too clear and blue to be natural. It's called Fluvius Cantus, apparently, Izuku said, leaning over to see the river better and getting out his pen. Not sure what that means, but it sounds Latin, I guess. Which isn't helpful because apparently the whole understanding English perfectly thing we got from coming here doesn't apply to a language like Latin, even though English is derived from that. It was still so strange how they could understand English from coming here. At first, Shouto was sure everything was somehow being translated into Japanese for him. But somewhere along the line, he definitely started hearing the English in, well, English. How and why did that happen? It seemed so strange for them to become fluent in another language just by falling through a portal. Then again, the whole town was strange. Maybe that was just another aspect of it. Shouto was broken out of his thoughts when Ochako yelled, Izuku, wait! He turned to see Izuku touching the water. There was a flash of blue and a strange feeling, as though Shouto had been dunked in the river himself. When that feeling faded, it was replaced by another, much stranger feeling. Everything was louder, was odder. Things felt different. Instinctively, he reached up to feel the top of his head. Instead of just hair, he could feel two new fluffy ears sticking out. What? Why is everything so big, all of a sudden? Achako's voice was a higher pitch than usual, and Shouto turned to where she was. Instead of a human girl, there was a small fairy, about the size of Shouto's hand, gossamer wings on her back. She gaped up at him. Um, Shouto, you've got more ears than usual, also a tail. Instinctively, Shouto felt behind him, and yup, there it was. And you're a fairy? Achako seemed to shiver at the reminder, fluttering her wings awkwardly and slowly rising so that she was eye to eye with him. Did, did the river do this? What else could it have been? They both turned to see Mina. Unlike Ochako, she didn't look that different, save for having one long horn instead of two tiny ones. She seemed to be poking at it awkwardly. So, I think I'm an Oni, now? And Ochako's a fairy, and Shouto, she got closer to inspect him. Can you open your mouth? Awkwardly, he did so. Uo, sharp canines, and the ears and tail, and the fact that one of your eyes is glowing. Really? Shouto instinctively brought a hand up to his eyes. Now that he was thinking about it, his left eye did feel weird. Interesting. Hesitantly, he tried to summon his flames. Unlike how it usually went, they responded immediately, creating a small blue fire in his palm. When he thought about different images, they flickered to show them a gnome, a time symbol, Quentin Trembly. I think I think I'm a Kitsune, he admitted. This is super weird, Achako said softly. Then she stiffened. Wait, where's Izuku? Right here. They all looked up to see him awkwardly flapping down towards them. Like Ochako, he had wings, but unlike her, they were feathery and vibrant, colored in red, orange, and gold. Where his feet once were, now there were talons. He landed awkwardly, and Mina reached out to steady him. So, we all got turned into magical creatures because of that thing? Looks like it, Shoto confirmed. Would that make you a phoenix? I freaked out and my wings burst into flame a little, so I think so, Izuku admitted. Shoto looked up again and saw that some of the leaves and branches on the trees above them were smoking. I'm so sorry guys, I had no idea that would happen. Don't worry, we'll fix this, Achako encouraged, flying over to him. We always do, right? Right, Izuku agreed hesitantly. It's just the author didn't know anything about this, so we won't get any help from the journal. We'll need to figure out another way. He looked thoughtful. Maybe we should explore the river a bit, and if we can't find anything to help, then head back to the shack and regroup there. Sounds like a good plan, Mina encouraged. Unfortunately, looking around the river turned up nothing. Izuku touched the water again, 
but they didn't go back to normal. Temporarily out of options, the four headed towards the mystery shack, Ochako riding on Izuku's shoulder. As soon as they arrived, it was apparent that something was wrong. If Stan's confused yelling hadn't given it away, the fact that Wendy looked like some sort of weird werewolf definitely would have. Are you some sort of werefox? Izuku guessed hesitantly. Wendy sighed, looking extremely awkward. Not that Shadow could blame her. That's my best guess. One second I was leaving the shop for some fresh air, the next I had different limbs than normal. She nodded at Shadow. You a werefox too? Kitsune, he corrected, pointing at his eye. Pretty sure this is my Hoshi no Tama. She blinked. Hoshi what? Star ball. It's a Kitsune thing. Ah, she shrugged. I don't know much about Japanese magical creatures, so I'll take your word for it. Do you think everyone was affected by this weird thing? Inside, Stan let out another yell. Probably, Achako guessed. The five of them hurried inside the shack. In the living room, they found both Stan and Suze. Stan's skin was now a dull gray, his eyes a glowing white, his ears pointed. On his back was a set of massive wings. Shouto suspected that he was some sort of gargoyle. Suze, on the other hand, seemed to be made of more earthen materials, with the only major differences being what he was made of, and the fact that his name seemed to be imprinted onto his forehead. Stan caught sight of them first and groaned. You kids too? Just how many people got turned into freaks like us? We're not sure if this is just a mystery shack thing, or if the whole town has been affected, Shadow admitted. We could go into town and see. If it's just us, you'd get a lot of weird looks, Wendy pointed out. But the blind eye is gone, right? Achako said. Without the cultists, we'll probably be okay. Wendy and Suze nodded, and so too did Stan Shadow wondered if he'd known about the cultists beforehand. The memory of their leader saying that the cult stayed away from the mystery shack as part of their founding principles came back to him, and he wondered just what Stan had done to earn that reputation with the blind eye. Their main question was answered as soon as they walked into town. Everyone, from Pinocchio Toby to little vampire Gideon, who they ardently avoided to Gorgon Pacifica, had been turned into some kind of supernatural creature. Walking around were centaurs, servitors, and unitors, nagas, kappas, and merfolk ghosts, zombies, and demons. What would Mermando think of this? Mina wondered, as they passed a mermaid in a tank, being rolled around by her leprechaun wife. No one seems to be particularly bothered, Izuku said hesitantly. Then again. Most of them have addled minds already, Shadow finished. We should still try and solve this as soon as possible. Unsure of what to do next, they found themselves at Lazy Susan's diner, filled with all manner of creatures and one suspiciously human-looking guy, bottles of potions strapped to his waist and possibly real small white wings on his back. Shadow nudged the others and pointed to the man. Considering he looks so out of place, maybe he was already magical and therefore didn't need to transform. Then he might be someone to ask about all of this, Izuku concluded. The four of them made their way over to his seat, Shadow sat down at the edge, trying to figure out how to make the booth work with the tail he now needed to worry about. Um, hello. The man looked up at them. Hello, you four. What can the love god do for you today? Mina's eyes widened. Love, oh, you're one of the incoming bands for the Woodstick Festival. Wendy mentioned you. Then she frowned. I wonder if all those people in those hot air balloons also got turned into magical creatures. Love God sat up straighter. You've noticed, then? This town wasn't like this when I was last here, but no one seems to be bothered by it, so I wasn't sure when this happened. Izuku chuckled awkwardly. Um, like an hour or so ago? We found this strange magical stream and I touched it, and the next thing we knew, everyone was some kind of magical creature. And, we're not sure how to reverse it. Fluvius Cantus, Love God guessed. At their surprised expression, he sighed. Listen, I'm a cherub, and not because of a magic stream I've always been one. I know a thing or two about crazy magic. You kids had no idea what you were messing with. Then, do you know how we can fix this? Izuku asked, awkwardly trying to tuck his wings in a comfortable position behind him. We can't just all stay like this forever. Well, I could whip up a potion that'll turn everyone back to normal with some water from the Fluvius Cantus, Love God mused. But it won't be easy. 
in order to transform an entire town. Only one person needs to touch the stream. But to turn everyone back, a lot of people need to be hit by that antidote at once. That's very arbitrary, Shouto pointed out. Love God snorted. Complained to the magic stream, I didn't make the rules. Well, the Woodstick Festival would be perfect for that, right? Achako hedged hesitantly. If we hit everyone there with the antidote while the concert is happening, would that be enough? Should be, Love God agreed. We'd need to be up high like in one of those hot air balloons. And by we, I mean you, because I need to be on stage. If we tell Stan he could benefit from it, he'd probably let us build a hot air balloon, Mina suggested. We'll get you the stream water to make that potion, Ochako promised, flying over to love God so he could shake her tiny hand, and then we'll take care of the rest. Deal, love God promised. It didn't take them long to get the water love God needed to start making his potion and so they focused on their end of the bargain. Thankfully, they didn't need to convince Stan Suze had already done that for them, encouraging Stan to appeal to the incoming youth and think of them as a source of potential income, fangs, claws, feathers, scales, or none of the above. Stan laid out the blueprints for what he wanted, and they set to work. Having talons for feet was probably the worst part of his transformation, Izuku decided. The wings were very pretty, and while bursting into fire every time he freaked out was annoying, he'd seen enough that not a lot got to him at this point. He'd even discovered a bigger benefit while they were making the hot air balloon. Izuku had cut himself pretty badly, and the cut had healed itself in seconds. If only he could have had that power when he was using one for all. Things would have been so much easier. Recovery girl wouldn't have needed to keep healing him. But the talons were awkward, hard to walk on, and meant he was technically going everywhere barefoot, which was just weird. He really hoped the antidote would work, he didn't want to have to get used to them. Still, having wings was helpful when it came to fixing things up, as he and Ochako could reach places they wouldn't have been able to previously. Ochako didn't seem to have her amulet on her, but the power stayed with the fairy form, which was useful when considering her now tiny size. She rested on his shoulder for a moment, wiping her brow as they watched Mina lift a tree that had nearly crushed their project away with little effort. I think this is near the top of my weirdest moments list, and we've had a lot of weird moments. Oh, agreed. Shouto and Mina seemed less bothered likely because Mina seemed pretty much the same, save for the supernatural strength. And while Shouto looked uncomfortable with the extra appendages, being a Kitsune meant he actually had a lot more control over his flames than before, but all four of them were ready for this to be over. All right, Stan's balloon is all set up, Mina finally said, dusting off her hands. Now we just need the potion from Love God, the altered hose to spray it that Suze was making, and for the concert to actually start, and we're all good. We're almost there. There was visible relief in Ochako's voice, I won't be small anymore, I mean, unless someone uses the shrink ray on me, but I'll try not to let that happen because it's really annoying the longer you stay tiny. Shouto nodded at her, then looked at Izuku. I'm surprised you haven't gone flying yet, since this'll be over soon. Izuku frowned at him. I have. You saw me fly up to attach those ropes. I meant, fly, fly, you know, soaring through the sky. Shouto motioned vaguely upwards. If you're a phoenix, you should be able to do that. Shouto had a point. How many people without flying quirks could get this opportunity? I think I'll try that, Izuku admitted. My wings aren't strong enough for that, Achako pouted. Then she perked up. Mind if I hitch a ride with you? Oh, of course not. All right, let's try this out. Izuku crouched a bit, then, on instinct, shot into the air, flapping his wings to get more altitude hearing Ochako's delighted yells in one of his ears. His wings caught the breeze, and the two of them were soaring up with the air balloons over the town proper, looking down on everything below them, which now seemed so small. Do a barrel roll, Ochako laughed next to him, and Izuku happily complied, feeling the rush of joy that came with a unique experience like this one. It was better than being floated via amulet, or that time Izuku and Shado had ridden that inflatable balloon over to the shack. This was amazing. All right, so there were some things he would miss when this was all over. The balloon was exactly how Stan wanted it to be his smiling face, with a sign above the face saying, I heart kids in bold letters. 
perfect for attracting customers. You make sure everyone sees this, yeah here, Stan said as they boarded the air balloon, the potion from Love God all set to be sprayed. Mina gave him a thumbs up. You got it, and everyone will be looking up at us anyways, while we're spraying the antidote. That'll make them want to come to the shack even more. A good positive from all of this, Stan grumbled. I'd like to go back to not being made of stone, thank you very much. And having Suze as a golem is just awkward. I'm not even a rabbi. Mina wasn't sure what rabbis had to do with anything, but she guessed that golems were from Jewish tales, and Stan had occasionally spoken in what she thought was Yiddish, so she'd take his word for it. Shouto ignited the air balloon with his fire, and the balloon immediately lifted into the air, drifting towards the concert. Then he turned to look at Izuku and Ochako, both seated in the balloon. Couldn't you two fly over? If everything goes right, we'll get turned back to normal, Izuku pointed out. I don't want to lose my wings while I'm this high in the air. Fair point. They reached the concert, where Love God was currently performing on stage. Everyone ready? Izuku asked, and released the antidote. Mina inserted the potion and activated the hose, spraying the antidote down on the crowd. There was a moment of confusion as everyone seemed to wonder why they were wet, and then a large blue light. And Mina could feel her two normal horns on the top of her head. Izuku was standing there with no wings and bare feet, Ochako was back to her normal size, and Shouto had the normal amount of appendages. All of them breathed a sigh of relief. Then the blue flame sputtered, and in typical chaotic fashion, started burning out of control, quickly consuming parts of the balloon itself. The basket they were in jerked violently, and started going down. Hang on, Ochako floated them out, touching down on the ground, and Mina watched as the previously cheerful balloon turned into a nightmare. The burning, melting face of Stan, below a banner that now said, I eat kids, drifting down on screaming townsfolk who used very human methods to get out of its path. Izuku winced. Well, Stan probably won't be too happy with us. Are you kidding? They all turned to see Stan and Suze approaching. When nearby people recognized his face, they shrieked and turned away. Who needs to be loved when I can be this feared? It's great. Isn't it bad for business, though? Shouto wondered. Stan waved him off. May, they'll all be gone in a day or two. Doesn't really matter to me. So, Ochako finally said, as the four of them retired in their attic bedroom. That might be one of the weirdest days we've had. On the other hand, some things did seem to stick. She took off her amulet, and then concentrated, watching her pillow rise with the same turquoise glow. I can't lift much without the necklace, but some of that power seemed to stick. Same here, Mina admitted. I was super strong as an oni, and I tried lifting that tree again, and I could still do it. Shouto lifted a hand, which lit up with blue flames. A second later, multiple things went flying around the room. Looks like my control over this didn't stick. That's unfortunate, I was hoping it would. Izuku looked thoughtful, before suddenly kneeing his desk as hard as possible. Ochako cried out, but then Izuku rolled up his pant leg, and the bruise faded before their eyes. So, that healing stuck too. I really hope I get to keep it when we get home. Then I could actually use one for all right. Ochako shuddered. Okay, but please don't hurt yourself on purpose again. I know you've broken bones, but that doesn't mean you can just bruise yourself to test something out. Izuku blinked, then seemed to take in all of their concerned faces. He laughed awkwardly. Oh, all right, if it really bothers you. It does, Shouto said firmly. Please don't do that again. Even if you can heal after breaking bones, there's gotta be a better way to go about things, Mina agreed, looking a little shaken. All Might doesn't break bones, so that's not normal. Maybe you're not using it the right way. Izuku blinked. Then what would be the right way to use it? The way where you don't break bones, Shouto deadpanned, rubbing the bandages on his arms. Ochako was suddenly struck with the memory of Cypher's note, how he hurt himself in Shouto's body for fun, and how he'd planned to throw Shouto off the water tower and make it look like a suicide. All that considered, Shouto was taking this surprisingly well. We'll help you figure it out, Ochako promised. Just don't keep hurting yourself, okay? Okay, Izuku tentatively agreed. He still looked a bit perplexed. I didn't realize it mattered so much to you guys. You're our friend, of course it matters, 
Mina replied fiercely. It hurts to see you hurt. It hurts to see any of you hurt, Izuku. Are you crying? I'm sorry, Izuku sobbed. It's just, wow, you guys really care a lot, and I know we've been friends for months now and are also living together, but that's still so different than what I'm used to and... Ochako's heart broke a little, and she went over to Izuku, wrapping him in a hug. We are your friends, Izuku. And that's what friends do, we care about each other. Izuku still seemed a bit unconvinced, and Ochako wondered if he was thinking of Bakugo. When they got back, Ochako decided she was definitely going to punch the jerk in the face. Mina joined the hug, and after a moment, Shouto did too, albeit awkwardly. A strange day, ending on a strange note. But it wasn't really a bad one. Maybe they really would be okay. You asked for it, you got it. Next up, a 48-hour marathon of ghost harassers on the Used to Be About History channel. Ochako grinned at her couch companion. Everything ready? Popcorn? Check. Pizza? Check. Drinks? Check. Guidebook for this universe's jokes, so we don't get lost with the humor. Obviously, Shadow confirmed, ready to not move until sunset. You bet I am. Suddenly the screen changed, and Toby Determined's voice rang out from the TV. We interrupt this program to bring you breaking news. Ochako frowned at the screen. Ah, what? It was just starting. Nothing Toby says can ever really be calling breaking news, Shadow agreed dryly. Hey, it's starting. The two of them looked over to see Grenda and Candy entering the room, followed by a confused but intrigued Izuku and Mina. Turn it up. The four of them gathered around the TV as the new broadcast continued. The screen switched to show Toby, looking absolutely filthy next to a tent, flies buzzing around him. Well, tonight's the night, but I've been out here for days, the Northwest family's annual ball shindig is here, and even though common folk aren't let in, that won't stop us from camping out to get a peek at the fanciness. Images of people camping out, chatting excitedly outside the Northwest mansion gates, flew across the screen. Ochako huffed. Seriously? This is breaking news? It's just some rich people party. Who even cares? Shadow nodded. I've been to those. They're not very fun. Maybe this one is different, Izuku offered. I mean, from what we saw of her house that one time, it really was amazing. At the very least, it would be fun to explore. Forget exploration, I've heard that they give out live quails in their gift baskets, Grender revealed. That's the kind of party I definitely want to check out. That does sound awesome, Mina agreed. Give me your life, Pacifica, Candy sighed dreamily, as Pacifica was shown waving at the crowd. Guys, in case you haven't forgotten, Pacifica Northwest is the worst. Ochako certainly hadn't forgotten. All those insults towards Mina, all the time she'd mocked Ochako for not having money. Sure, she and Mina had pretty much settled on some sort of peaceful truce after that mini-golf mess, but that didn't mean Ochako had to start liking her. Someone knocked on the door, and she got up to answer it. And that's not jealousy talking I'd say that to her face. She opened the door to a familiar blonde teen, wearing sunglasses, a trench coat, and a purple scarf. I need your help. Ochako blinked at her. You're the worst. Then she shut the door and turned back to the others. See? The others stared at her for a moment, before Pacifica knocked on the door again, more rapidly this time. Ochako sighed and opened it. What do you even want? Look, you think it's easy for me to come here? She swatted a fly away from her face. I don't want to be seen in this hovel, but there's something haunting Northwest Manor, and we're willing to hire you and Shouto to help. If you don't, the party could be ruined. Shouto, who was walking over, blinked. Why me and Ochako specifically? Pacifica shrugged. We saw you too in the papers, taking down that massive vampire bat and saving those cops. Oh right, at... Is this like that thing with the fighting game character, where Izuku and I aren't going to find out how that happened? Mina wondered curiously. Nah, it's just a long story. Honestly, both of those instances were so weird. Although Ochako guessed that it made sense. Without the cult, people were now accepting and talking about the strangeness in the town. Naturally some of their adventures might make the paper. She turned back to Pacifica. How much money are we talking about? 4,000 each, Pacifica informed her. 
and don't try to negotiate the price with me. If you don't like it, take it up with my parents. Honestly, that was super cheap, even in American dollars. Considering how rich the Northwests were, they were totally being scammed. But it was $8,000 more than they already had, and hopefully they wouldn't be doing any long-term saving in this world. 4,000 each, and Mina, Izuku, Candy, and Grenda can come, Shadow countered. At their surprised looks, he shrugged. You guys did say you wanted to go, and it wouldn't be fair if only Ochako and I went. Grenda, Candy, and Mina cheered, while Izuku looked more curious than anything. Pacifica seemed to consider this, twitching slightly, as though the idea of letting all these common folk enter her very special house for her very special party was disdainful. Still, she relented, pulling golden invitations out of her jacket. You're just lucky I'm desperate. The others cheered. Desperate, desperate. We'll lend you some dresses it'll be great, Candy insisted. Not sure about the boys though. We could probably ask Stan, Izuku suggested. I'm sure he knows a good place to get cheap suits. Pacifica rolled her eyes at them. Just be there on time, all right? Yeah, yeah, we'll be there, Ochako agreed. At least her first and possibly last fancy rich person party should be interesting. They pulled up to the mansion in a black Rolls Royce, as people cheered and guards under umbrellas lined up on each side of the driveway. The gates were open, and they entered the grounds of the manor they'd only seen a glimpse of before. Welcome to Northwest Manor Dorks, Pacifica announced, as the front doors were opened in front of them. Try not to touch anything. It was a grand entrance room, filled with deep stone and mahogany, a grand staircase leading upwards, maids and butlers fixing up the final finishing touches for the party below. Above, there hung the fossil of a massive aquatic dinosaur. A cider fountain was being set up, as was an ice sculpture of Pacifica as a mermaid. It was rather incredible, Shouto could admit. He was used to big houses, considering his father, but their home, and the homes Shouto had visited, were mostly Japanese in design. This was his first time experiencing a rustic western home like this. Oh wow, everything is fancy, Mina exclaimed as she looked around, unconsciously adjusting the sleeves of her white gold dress. I've never seen anything like this outside of TV shows. I can't believe some people really live like this. I mean, it's great, but what's the point of it all, Ochako muttered. She'd gotten dressed for the occasion as well, wearing a cute pink dress, but she still didn't seem very happy to be here. To impress all of our guests, obviously, Pacifica huffed, leading them further into her house. High standards are what make the Northwest family great. Not that I'd expect you to get that. Shouto raised an eyebrow. I thought that was lying about founding the town, predictably, she ignored him. The rumors were true, Candy held up her gift basket, and out of it emerged a live quail and two chicks. Although, I'm not sure how to get them back in the basket. Ah, if it isn't the duo of the hour. Shouto looked away from Candy and Grenda chasing the quails to see Pacifica's parents approaching them. Next to them, Pacifica stiffened a little and stood up straighter. The hairs on the back of Shouto's neck stood up. Are you two going to be okay? Izuku asked, shifting his bow tie around nervously. He'd gone with a bow tie rather than a normal tie like Shouto, admitting that it probably wouldn't look the best to be wearing normal ties at a fancy party considering how bad he was at tying them. Yeah, don't worry, Ochako waved him off. You guys have fun, we'll join you soon. Mina and Izuku wandered a little ways away, but not too far, clearly still keeping an eye on them. Shouto appreciated the gesture. Well then, I assume that means you'll try to fix our situation before the guests arrive. We'll do our best, Shouto assured him coolly, as Ochako nodded alongside him. Excellent, Pacifica. Take our guests to the problem room. Pacifica nodded and led Shouto and Ochako away, through the arching, gilded halls of the Northwest Mansion. Ochako gripped her amulet a bit tighter, and Shouto shifted the bag around his neck, carrying anointed water as well as the journal with the exorcist chant. He pulled out both and handed the former to Ochako, flipping through the pages of the latter. This is the main room where it's been happening, Pacifica said, leading them into a small room with a pool table, a wall covered entirely in bookshelves, a fireplace, above which sat a painting of a lumberjack, and dozens of taxidermized animals of all species. Yeah, this looks like the kind of room that would be haunted, all right, Ochako admitted, looking around. 
I wouldn't be too worried, though. Ghosts land on a 10-category scale, and floating plates sound like a Category 1. Shouto flipped open the book and landed on the page, showing the author's rendition of a Category 1 ghost. Pacificer raised an eyebrow. So what, are you going to bore him back to the afterlife by reading from this book? We'll perform an exorcism that way if we need to. But hopefully we can just splash him with anointed water, and he'll be out of your hair, Shadow said, turning back to study the room. Thunder rumbled, and then, something was different. The painting, Ochako hissed, and Shadow looked over to see that the lumberjack in the painting had vanished. Shit. Pacifica screamed, looking down at her feet as blood dripped onto the floor around her. Looking up, Shouto saw that the taxidermy heads were starting to bleed from the eyes and the mouth, chanting, Ancient sins, ancient sins. The window shutters slammed, and objects started flying around the room, circling about their heads. Ochako clutched her pendant and reached out, light covering the objects then sputtering out, yanked back from her control. Miniature clouds gathered around the chandelier on the ceiling, lightning flashing inside them. What is this? Pacifica yelled, as the three of them backed up against each other in the center of the room. What do we do? The bottle holding the anointed water shattered in Ochako's hand, and the fireplace roared out of control. Even with that convenience store, I could still control the flying objects, she whispered. This is a Category 10. Ancient blood and blackened skies, the forest dark shall once more rise. The heads on the walls chanted, blood still pouring out of their mouths and eyes. The fireplace roared once again, and this time, a skeletal hand emerged, followed by another. Then a torso and head, the latter cleaved in with an axe. Skin and clothes grew around the skeletal frame, forming the lumberjack of the painting. Shouto grabbed Pacifica's hand, and the three of them ducked around the flying objects and dove under the pool table before the ghost could catch sight of them. I smell a northwest, the ghost boomed, blue fire bursting out of its head in the shape of a long wild beard. A double-handed axe appeared in one hand, then slammed into the ground as the ghost dragged it behind him. Come out, come out, wherever you are. Hurry, say your dumb exorcism already, Pacifica hissed. Shouto flipped through the pages, landing once again on the spell. Right, Abite Spiritus Immundus, et Pacem Lucrificer. Found you. The table lifted above and away from them, and Shouto rolled to the side, just as the axe slammed down where he once was. Do not try to bind me. The prophecy will be fulfilled, and I will have my vengeance. This way, Pacifica scrambled to her feet and led them out of the room. They ran down the halls, the ghost chasing after them. No offense, but why do you have a painting of some guy who's sworn vengeance on your family in your house? Ochako panted, dodging the objects that were rocketing towards them. Isn't that basically asking for trouble? Hey, don't blame me, I didn't put that thing there. The ghost's laughter echoed behind them, and Shouto dodged a tree root that seemed to be growing out of nowhere. The further they ran, the more plants started covering the walls. Your manor, built on our blood and sacrifice, will be a forest. Your guests, wood, a hundred and fifty years I've waited, to avenge our deaths on the family so hated. The guests? Ochako's eyes widened. The others? Has this weird forest spell hit the main dining hall yet? We need to save them. We will, once we get rid of the ghost, Shadow agreed, dodging a charging taxidermized animal. He isn't giving us the time to perform the exorcism we'll need another way. A silver mirror, Ochako agreed. We can catch him with one. They rounded another corner and ran through a small garden. Watch out for the peacocks, Pacifica warned them, lifting up the hem of her dress. The warning came a bit too late one of the birds smacked Ochako in the face. She scowled, ducking under a rapidly growing tree. Have I mentioned how much I hate this place yet? Several times, Shouto said blandly. They entered the house again, mud tracking behind them, water from the storm dripping off their hair and clothes. There, that room has a silver mirror. He made to head into the room, but was stopped by two hands grabbing his arm and pulling him back. Wait, that room has my parents' favorite carpet pattern. They'll lose it if we track mud in there. We can't afford to worry about a dumb carpet, Ochako yelled. But Shouto focused on Pacifica's face and the absolute terror in her expression. He knew that terror. We'll find another mirror, he agreed, 
backing away from the room and towards one of the walls with a tapestry on it only to find his hand going through the artwork and into empty space. In here. The other two followed him, ducking under the tapestry, which fluttered down behind them. Achako lit up her necklace, and the three of them surveyed the dusty room. What is this place? I, I don't know, Pacifica admitted, looking around. I've never seen this room before. When was it hidden away? She grabbed one of the sheets covering a mountain of objects, and pulled it down, looking at what was beneath, and then stepping away in horror. There were paintings, lots of them, mirror reflections of some of the paintings scattered around the manor, the ones that depicted the good deeds of the Northwest family. These paintings, however, told a different story liars, thieves, frauds, all grinning at the painter, happily destroying the lives of native people, townsfolk, nature. Oh, Ochako finally said quietly. Guess it wasn't just Nathaniel Northwest whose true identity was covered up. Pacifica stared blankly at the paintings, and Shadow noticed her hands were shaking. So, it's all true then. Her voice came out as a whisper, but it might as well have been a shout, considering how well Shadow heard it. Nathaniel Northwest really was the village idiot, and his son used all the money given to him for the cover-up to build our home. She shook even harder, glaring at the photos, and in the soft blue light of Ochako's amulet, her eyes looked shiny, like she was about to cry. The prophecy the ghost mentioned it was given to our ancestor when a mudslide killed the lumberjack. When he was locked out of a party he was promised he could attend my parents always told me, she trailed off, before suddenly sinking to her knees. You, you were right, Achako, she finally said. And Shouto, when you gave me that newspaper our family is just a line of frauds, and I'm the next link in that chain. Just a spoiled rich girl who's too scared of her parents too. She broke off, eyes widening, before looking up at them defensively. Never mind. Shouto and Ochako exchanged glances, and Shouto could see how pale his friend was. No, that's not, she sputtered, looking to him for help. Shouto nodded at her, before sitting down next to the heiress. I get it, he said quietly. Pacifica shot him a look. No, I'm pretty sure you don't. I'm pretty sure I do, Shouto countered. Parents like yours like ours they don't want a child. They want something they can mold into their own image, no matter what we want for ourselves. And when they realize they're dealing with someone who has their own opinions and doesn't want to just follow what they say, they'll try and beat it into us until we comply. Unconsciously, his hand went to his scar, and Pacifica's eyes widened. They there's a bell, she stammered. When whenever I went against them, they'd ring the bell, and then lock me in a small closet for four hours. Now I hear the bell, and I can't think of anything but the dark small space. I can't go against them. She pulled her arms around her knees. I'm too scared. It's scary, Shouto agreed. But I think you're braver than you give yourself credit for. You're not averting your eyes from the truth, even though it's hard. And admitting it takes a lot of courage, I know how hard that is. Ochako nodded vigorously. Shouto's right. Maybe you've been an asshole, but that doesn't mean you need to stay one. People change, I'm sure. There you are, Northwest. They all spun around to see the ghost emerging from the wall, axe poised to strike. You will not escape justice. Pacifica flinched, and without thinking, Shouto jumped in front of her, fire lit up in his hands. Next to him, Ochako did the same thing. What do you even think you're doing? She shouted at the ghost. You were killed by rich assholes, so you're taking it out on a 15-year-old girl. What kind of justice is that? The lumberjack paused briefly, before scowling at them. She is in Northwest, no matter her age, they are all the same, and they must all shoulder the blame. Bullshit, Shadow hissed. None of this is her fault. The sins of the fathers aren't for their children to bear, Ochako agreed shortly. Her parents are awful people, and so is most of her family line, but that doesn't mean she should be hurt for it. You're hurting an innocent person. Shouto stared the ghost right in his glowing eyes. I understand wanting vengeance against the people who hurt you. You have every right to feel hurt and angry. But Pacifica doesn't deserve that hate. The party guests are friends they don't deserve your wrath. Behind them, he could hear Pacifica's shaky breath, and then the girl got to her feet, pushing past the two of them to stand before the ghost. Shouto sucked in a breath, and Ochako reached for her, but she stood firm. I don't want to die for my family, she said softly. But I want to make things right, starting with you. 
How can I do that? The ghost reeled back, completely shaken, eyes comically wide. Then he looked at her with an appraising glance. A Northwest must open the party gates and fulfill the promise made so long ago. If you do that, then I will move on and lift the forest from your home. Then that's what I'll do. She turned around to give them both nervous glances. Can you back me up? We'll be right behind you, Achako promised. Shouto nodded firmly, extinguishing his flames. The ghost led them out of the room, and the three of them nervously followed, wandering the green-covered halls until they found themselves in the main room once again. Rather than rustic western, the room was now a true forest, more taxidermied animals roaming about, and wood statues of horrified partigoers littering the hall. Ochako sucked in a breath, and Shouto followed her gaze to see the statues of Mina and Izuku standing protectively in front of Candy, Grenda, and some other young guest he didn't know. A rush of protective fury filled him, and he forced himself to remain calm. Pacifica just needs to open the gate. Then they'll be okay. It's going to be okay. Pacifica looked just as horrified as they were. Then she took a deep breath, stealing her nerves and running over to the lever that would open the gate. Pacifica Elise Northwest, at the familiar voice, she froze. There, underneath a small trapdoor, were Pacifica's parents, glaring at her. Stop this instant, her father commanded. We can't let the town see us like this. We have a reputation to uphold. Just come into the panic room. We have enough food for a week and then we can eat the butler. Shouto gaped at them. Are you serious? If she doesn't do this, everyone here will die. Forget your reputation the ghost will come after you next, and you'll end up just like them. Pa, come and rabble like you wouldn't understand, the man scoffed. Pacifica, come, now. He pulled out a small bell. Oh, don't you dare. The bell was surrounded by familiar turquoise light, and then it went flying away. Ochako turned to Pacifica. You've got this. Pacifica held her father's gaze for one terrifying moment and then broke it, glaring at both of her parents. I won't let all these people die because of our family's sins. I won't be another link in the chain I'm going to fix this. And with that, she pulled the lever, opening the gate. Her parents gasped in horror. The lumberjack gasped in delight. Yes, yes, it's happening. My heart, once as hard as oak, now grows soft like, I don't know, birch, or something. The greenery faded away, and moments later, all the guests were back to normal, the taxidermy animals back in their proper places. The ghost smiled. Pacifica, you are not like the other Northwests. I feel lumber justice. And with that, he softly faded away. The axe that was embedded in his head clattered to the floor. Pacifica smiled at the place where the ghost had moved on, then looked at the two of them, her smile more shy. Ochako wasted no time, jumping forward and giving her a big hug. That was amazing. You're a real hero, you know? Pacifica blushed. I, um, thanks. Couldn't have done it without you too. But you were the one to save the day, in the end. Regardless of your parents, Shadow reminded her. That was amazing. Pacifica beamed. Hey, are you guys all right? What happened? Shouto looked over to see Mina and Izuku running over to them. There was a ghost, and then... Pacifica helped the ghost move on, Achako announced proudly, letting go of the other girl. It was super awesome. Mina blinked, then smiled. Oh, great job. Sounds like a wild story you'll have to tell us later. We will, Shouto promised, as the townsfolk poured into the building, running around exploring everything. For now though, we should probably, you know, celebrate? Or something. Mina grinned. Sounds like a plan to me. Without wasting another moment, she grabbed Shouto's arm and pulled him over to where different groups of people friends, couples, family were all starting to dance. So, you two are getting along with her, now? Yeah, Shouto admitted. She's still prickly, but it's not like I have room to complain. Besides, she's a lot like me, as it turns out. Similar situations. His friend's gaze softened. Oh, well, maybe some good friends to help support her is what she needs. Just like you. Yeah. The two of them spun around a bit, Mina guiding him through the dance. It was rather enjoyable. You know, I never could have imagined doing anything like this. When we first got here, Mina admitted. I mean, we got on each other's nerves all the time for the first couple weeks, didn't we? It's so strange, looking back on it. 
Shouto did know. It seemed like a lifetime ago that he'd been so annoyed with her. Maybe it was because things changed so drastically after they met Cypher for the first time, but when it came to Mina it was more than that. It feels like we've known each other forever. Now, he finally said. It feels a bit like that with Izuku and Ochako as well, but... Not to the same degree, Mina finished. Yeah, I get the feeling. She looked thoughtful. I mean, we'll have to go home eventually, but that doesn't mean we can't still hang out all the time. I don't want to lose any of you guys. We'll stick together, he agreed. For a brief moment, he felt that strange something in the back of his mind. It almost seemed to be laughing. This is pretty great, Achako said, looking around at all the fun everyone seemed to be having. Probably a lot more exciting than the usual party around here. Definitely. Pacifica's smile faded, and she frowned at the ground. Don't get used to it. Next year, things will be the same as always, I'm sure. Well, it's nice while it lasts, right? Izuku offered. Pacifica nodded, but she still seemed hesitant. Achako frowned. Hey, are you going to be okay after this? With your parents? I mean, Pacifica froze, before plastering on a disinterested expression. It's fine, I can handle their tantrum, or whatever. Izuku was smart he quickly caught on to what they meant, judging by the way his eyes widened. Are you sure? Because if you're not, then maybe you should have a sleepover somewhere else tonight, with one of your other friends. Or you could stay with us, Achako suggested. I know it's nothing compared to this place, but the people are nicer, and I'm sure the others wouldn't mind. And we'd keep your parents away, even if that means Stan chasing them out with a broom. Pacifica let out a surprised laugh at the mental image. Really, I'll be fine, but thanks for the offer. If you change your mind, let us know, Izuku insisted. Right? She looked between the two of them, then smirked. You two should go dance, you know, I'm going to see if I can get some food. Later nerds. She waved a lazy hand in their direction, before wandering off. Ochako looked towards the dancers, then back at Izuku before giving him an exaggerated bow and offering her hand. Might I have this dance, good sir? Izuku laughed, then mock curtsied. Of course, good lady. Oh, he was really cute. The two of them headed towards the dance floor and watched the other dancers, before trying some steps of their own. Neither were great at it, but Ochako found that laughing over their missteps was part of the fun. Shouto and Mina glided on by, talking softly to each other, and Ochako craned her head to get a better look. Hey, do you think I mean, those two have been pretty close lately, right? Izuku blinked and looked over at their friends. Yeah, but I don't think it's romantic, you know? I think they've just become really close friends. Yeah, Ochako was almost surprised by how quickly she agreed, but it did make sense. The other two were close, but that didn't always mean romantic feelings. Honestly, with the way they still bickered, they seemed more like siblings than anything. It's strange to think that if we hadn't been sent here by that portal villain, we might not have become friends with those two, she finally said. We're all pretty different now than when we first got here, aren't we? For sure, Izuku agreed. I mean, we have a lot more experience now than we did, even if we can't use our quirks. And we've got new powers of our own. We've all learned how to live together, and how to scam people and skirt the law from Stan, although that part probably isn't much of a good thing, even though it's definitely helped. It could be useful in figuring out villains' motives and how they operate when we become official heroes, he paused. And I'm rambling again. Sorry. Don't apologize, it's cute. Ochako's brain then caught up to her mouth, and she felt her cheeks warm. Across from her, Izuku looked a bit red too. Um, so, dancing. Dancing, Izuku agreed quickly, as the next song started playing. I'll try not to step on your toes as much anymore, I promise. Same here, no toe stepping. By the look of Izuku's sheepish grin, he knew just as well as her that they were both going to break that promise. Somehow, Ochako found she didn't mind at all. So alright folks that's all for today. Stay tuned for part 6. Do subscribe, like and share for more such videos. Also check out the story and author JK Awesome on finfiction.net. Press the bell icon to be notified first on release. See you in the next video till then goodbye.